That's Mark Twain. Too much of anything is bad. Too much good whiskey is barely enough. It's a bit of a theme tonight. We're going to talk a wee bit about just how much is too much whiskey and how much is too much good whiskey. I'll see you in a wee minute. Hello, whiskey folk. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to another Pub. Welcome to another Thursday night. Fantastic to see so many of you waiting for things to kick off. Just about on time tonight. Looking forward to hanging out with you for a little while. It's just me tonight, flying solo for a wee change. I've had weeks now, quite a few weeks, of uh, a bunch of guests, various guests. It's been fantastic to hang out with them all. Um, but tonight, it's a little bit of a break and uh, you're just going to be sitting, hanging out with me for a wee while. I hope that's okay. Talking about the Amber Rush. It's quite a lofty title, isn't it? Um, it's kind of been, I've been thinking about, is it the Amber Wave? Is it the Amber Surge? What, what is it? And kind of the Amber Rush seems to fit quite nicely. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a lot of things. I'm talking about, you know, the popularity of whiskey, I guess, how much whiskey's in demand. I'm speaking about, you know, whiskey is an investment. Whiskey is a collectible. Whiskey is something to share, to enjoy. Whiskey is something to get people together. Whiskey is something to build a distillery to make, to increase capacity, to, you know, the, the, the value raise going higher and higher all the time. That's kind of what I mean about the Amber Rush. But I'm not going to talk about too much about collecting, investing. We've had VPUBs in the past that have spoken about bottle chasing and the glass lock and concepts like that. Tonight is mostly about, like Twain was talking about there, the amount of whiskey we have. How much whiskey is there? How much good whiskey is there? And what is some of the negative sides of potentially having all that whiskey available and having that amber rush happening. I'm also looking forward to having your input, get your opinion on it as well. Um, this is very much a personal thing. Of course, it's going to be mostly my opinion, my thoughts on it and things. So I'd welcome your insight and opinion too. I'll jump into the lounge and welcome some of you beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated barflies. Yeah, I'll, I'll say welcome to Hans Waldman who joined the barfly uh, community just before we went live there. Thanks to Hans and thanks to all the barflies who click that join button under the video. It means that you never need to watch a monetized VPUB. These live streams will never be monetized. They'll never run ads. So as you pick them up on the replay and drop in and out from time to time, you don't need to sit through ads. So thanks to the barflies and thanks to everybody that buys me the virtual drams and things to contribute. It means that I do not need to run ads on the VPUBs. So thank you all very, very much for that. If you are watching this on the replay, I'm very, very grateful. And if you're watching this on Facebook, I apologize that I can't easily interact with you on Facebook. Most of the community is in here in the lounge and YouTube hanging out. Um, I do broadcast this out on Facebook because it's just a toggle switch. It's a button for me. It's easy, uh, but um, it means that I don't pick up your comments. The comments that I'm interacting with tonight are the YouTube stream. I hope that's okay. Whiskey Stream 5, Tony is in saying, good evening, Roy. Good to see you, Tony. I hope you're doing well. Robert, Rod, Robert, sorry, Robert Fredrickson is in and saying, tonight we have a Swedish dram in the glass. McMira moment. Slanche. Slanche to you, Robert. Nice to welcome you. And my friend Pete Head Frank is here. Finally, there you are. Yeah, was I, I don't think I was late tonight. I think it was pretty much on time. Bruno Martins is here saying, hi, Roy. Good to see you, Bruno. Jean Della Cuisine is in saying, good uh, evening, Roy, as well as Hoyt Hempel. Good to have you, Hoyt, as always. Gino Camo over there in Canada. Good to have you, Gino, and commenting on YouTube as well. Dancing Midgey Glenn is here. Glenn, I've got something that I want to share. Can I share that tonight? I'm going to share it tonight. I've got it sitting here at the side. I'll share it now, actually, since you're here. Uh, Glenn gave me a bit of a belated uh, gift for my 50th birthday. 
and it arrived earlier this week. Uh, no, it didn't. It arrived on Friday. And Friday was a difficult day for me because I was recovering from Thursday the night before. Not because of too much whiskey, but just because of the kind of outpouring of really lovely words and really uh, nice uh, emotions and things. Nice sentiment, let's say, that happened when we celebrated the three years of the V-Pub on Thursday. So, um, yes, I was still in kind of just, you know, reading through comments, reading through some of the feedback and things from Thursday. So I was I was already quite um, touched by it all. And then I opened up a package that arrived in the mail um, on Friday morning. And this is what I unwrapped. I've been admiring this and things like it from from Glenn for a long time now on his social media has been sharing this kind of stuff. But this is a, an original painting by Glenn, Dancing Midgey, in oil. And I, I know for a fact that this camera is not going to do this picture justice. I showed this to my patrons on Sunday night in the VPUB lock-in. Um, and really, you, you can't see on the camera just how striking and gorgeous a picture this is. From a short distance, it's almost photorealistic with the reflection on the water and the contrast there of the buildings against the background and things. Um, I'm currently researching a nice frame and mount for it. I shouldn't really be touching it with my fingers, should I? Um, but I'm blown away by it. Glenn, you could have uh, uh, blown me over with a feather when that arrived on Friday. I'm very, very grateful for it. Um, I hope you take commissions because I can see there's going to be a demand for things like that in the future. It's absolutely beautiful and I'm very, very touched to have it. Just as a super dram a super chat, sorry, comes in from my friend Hans. He's saying, you're welcome. Hello, everybody. I'm Alexander. I'm fairly new to whiskey and this is my first VPUB. So I'll sit back and learn a bit. I can't I promise that you'll learn a bit, Hans. Um, if you do want to learn, I would suggest that you um, interact with your fellow barflies there in the lounge. The knowledge in our lounge, the knowledge in our community is huge. Um, what you get from me is uh, mostly just my opinion, but I'm very grateful to have you. I'm very grateful to welcome you to your first VPUB hands and also welcome you to the barflies. Thank you to Hans and a huge thank you to my friend Dancing Midgey for that amazing oil painting. Cheers. Peter Wilcox. Hi, Roy from Pete and D. Cheers. Good to see you, Pete and D. Good to have you in. Thomas Shevlin looks like a new name and he's saying first time watching an Aquavita stream live, getting back into whiskey and just bought myself a nice bottle of Bunahavan Tochikada coming Sunday. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. I think it's a really good example of Peter Bunahavan. Um, a nice one to sit with coming into winter as well. Not too expensive. Um, there's been a huge theme throughout the year. Um, and this kind of Amber Rush thing, this thing that we're going to talk about tonight, how much whiskey there is actually out there in the world, is going to continue that kind of focus and theme that I've had this year. Kind of looking at value, um, trying to discover where the value is in whiskey, um, and what we can do as a community to find where the good quality is at decent prices. Whiskey Games, Matthew Bishop is in uh, uh, one month till Christmas. It is. Do you know what I have to say? I'm a bit late. I want to say happy Thanksgiving to all the Americans out there. I'm very aware that it's Thanksgiving tonight, but it's Thursday, so it clashed. And I didn't I didn't really feel like it was it's okay to go out on Thanksgiving, I'm I'm sure. The first ever V pub on the 23rd of November 2017, the one that we celebrated three years of last week, I went out live on Thanksgiving. So I, I guess it must be like the second last Thursday in the month or something. Um, but I should raise a glass to all my friends in the USA who celebrate Thanksgiving and say, I hope you're comfortable, I hope you're relaxing and happy Thanksgiving. I appreciate that a lot of you will not be in here. You'll be having some wonderful fare and, and food and family time, I guess. But if you are here, I'll raise a glass and welcome you and say happy Thanksgiving to you. But you're right, Matt, it is one month to Christmas. That's terrifying. Hoyt is saying hello. Who did I miss? Scotch Buddy is here. Good to see you. Uh, hello, Aquavite and all. Yash is in. Good to see you, Yash. Even Roy, I'm delighted to be able to join live once again after missing the last couple of EPUBs. There is no obligation here, Yash. When it suits your mood, when it suits your life, uh, when 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 you can spend time in the VPUB, you come along in the VPUB. When you can't, 
you can pick it up on the replay or just skip a few and join a bit later. Mark Slinger is in as well from, from up north. Good to see you, Mark. I hope you're doing very well, my friend. Carl Van Walling is in from Belgium. Evening, Roy. Evening, Carl. I hope you're well. Uh, Tom Bueller Bells Tom is in. Hello, another Amber Rush pushed me to a 2008 Bushmills tonight. <laughs> That's what it's doing to a lot of us. Not necessarily the Bushmills, but whiskey in general. Jimmy Legacy saying, I'm, it must be nice to be you. So many surprise gifts in the mail. I I don't know. It, it is. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. It's, it is. It's genuinely wonderful. Um, but it's it's I, I'm going to have to work out how to deal with the sense of wanting to kind of repay uh, or or uh, return the gifts, return the gestures. Um, what I should be do, what I should do is just learn how to graciously be very grateful and thankful for it, and just enjoy the fact that it's a nice gift. Um, but I it is Jimmy, you're right. It is good to be me, especially when gifts drop in the post. Greg is saying, uh, hi, Aquaviti and everyone finishing something and we'll be back in the chat, but listening in a moment. Take your time, Greg. There's no rush whatsoever, my friend. Good to see you, Greg, from France. Um, I want to take a wee moment, a bit of a sombre moment, um, and, and give our thoughts to a friend who's still probably struggling, um, Dwayne Large, or as I occasionally refer to him, Sir Dwayne. He was a constant fi fixture of our community for a long, long time. Um, but uh, in recent weeks, we've heard that he's, um, his health has taken a turn for, for the worst, for the worst, and he is um, facing some weeks of recovery ahead. Um, Dwayne, you're always in my thoughts, but you're especially in my thoughts this week because I know on Saturday um, is your birthday, my friend. And I know that you were looking forward to this birthday and you had designs and plans for it. I know that those have been changed a wee bit. I'm hoping that you're able to tune into these VPUBs and I hope you're able to pick up just how much the community is missing you and thinking about you. And I'm sure that we are going to find a way to get a message across to you on Saturday to tell you many happy returns and have a very happy birthday, despite everything, my friend. I hope you're doing well. Happy birthday, Sir Dwayne. Cheers. Matt Zittrick is in saying congrats on three years, Roy. Happy Thanksgiving to the Americans in the audience. You're in Texas, Matt, probably planning something fabulous down there. I would not know anything about too much whiskey. <laughs> He's an absolutely perfect example of that very thing. I imagine the man has more whiskey than space in his home. Um, but he does very well with it, and he's very good at sharing it. Eric Waite is in tonight. Good to see you, Eric. Neil Cochran is here. My cousin, Kevin Grant on Whiskey. Congratulations on finally uh, be being able to um, don that black cap and call yourself a police officer, my friend. Congratulations. I'm really, really chuffed for you too. Lee J. Brown is here. Good to see you, Lee J. Uh, Hellswood is in. Good to see you, Helen. I hope Andy's sitting next to you. Welsh Toro is in. Good to see you, Welsh. I hope you're doing well. Okay. Um, when the Amber Rush thing is positive, let's start out by saying that this is a very positive thing. And let's also start out by saying that if any time I lean into the negative and I, and I kind of measure up as something that is negative for whatever reasons, I want to talk about the fact that I am very much part of the problem. Maybe you are too. Maybe we are part of the problem. Because the only reason that a rush for whis whiskey in any form exists is because people are buying it, people are enjoying it. The whiskey that people are collecting, the whiskey that's in demand, the whiskey that is desirable, let's say, is only desirable because somebody opened that and shared it and raved about it. And that's true for almost all the whiskeys that exists and has desirability and commands a high price. So if I sit here, <laughs> or if I just want on one-to-one, -one, or if, if at any point I'm evangelizing about a specific whiskey, then, you know, the chances are that other people are going to do the same thing, and other people are going to do the same thing, and other people are going to do the same thing, and potentially we drive the demand for that product as a community as whiskey appreciators, as whiskey fans. We're going to drive desire for it. We're going to drive the prices up. We, we have to accept that we are doing it. 
But what's the alternative? We're not going to stay secretive about it. We're not going to keep it close to our chests. Whiskey is all about sharing. So we're going to continue to do that very much. So I'm going to continue to do that. But what I'm going to focus on and what you've seen me focusing on this year, I hope you've noticed it with some exceptions, but generally I've been focusing on whiskies that bring the value. But it's not just about cheap whiskies. It's about whiskies that bring us the good presentation too, that bring quality, that bring us natural whiskey that doesn't have anything taken out of it and doesn't have anything added to it. I'm speaking about malt. And for the most part tonight, I will be speaking about Scotch malt whiskey, but you can basically extend any of the discussion to any whiskey category ac across the, the globe right now, honestly speaking. Natural whiskey, tasty whiskey, whiskey that we want to evangelize about, whiskey that we want to get excited about and sit down and share. That's the whiskey I've been trying to focus on this year because it does exist. Lots of it exists. I've got at least one, hopefully two examples of it tonight. So we are part of the problem. If we focus on the fact that it's Scotch malt whiskey and go back about 12, 15 years, we were making just over two, uh, two billion litres. That's wrong. We were making over just over 200 million litres. Now, we have the capacity to make over 400 million litres. It has almost doubled in about 12 to 15 years. Now, we don't use all the capacity. We're probably running, depending on which distillery, which producer that you look at, it's running be between somewhere between 60 and 70% of capacity across. But it's difficult to find out. If you look at uh, certain distilleries, they're willing to share how much capacity that they're actually running at. Um, we might have heard quite recently, as, as recently as last week on the VPUB last week, that Tomatin, uh, with a capacity of somewhere approaching four or five million litres, theoretically, they're probably two to two and a half million. So about half. Other distilleries are running a wee bit harder than that. But 12 or 15 years ago, they were running at closer to 80% of capacity. They were running out of capacity. So then they had to extend capacity. They had to put on extra shifts because they worked out that they were running out of whiskey. They were not keeping up with the boom in Scotch whiskey. And now we're in a situation that we're at double that. And I want to ask a few questions tonight about is the community double what it was 12 or 15 years ago? Is the potential market, is the, are the pockets out there deep enough to support that? And the big question I want to ask is, where is all that whiskey? Where is all that mature stock? Uh, Tom Elmer is in saying, so in 12 to 15 years, we'll finally catch up Aquavitae. My argument is that it's been, it's that capacity has been, has been building uh, Thomas for the last 12 to 15 years. Rush Toro saying it's not us that are responsible for the amber rush. The distilleries and indie bottlers are fleecing us and taking advantage. We can talk about that. We we can talk about that. Um, <laughs> they can only fleece us and take advantage of us Welsh. And I'm not specifically speaking about me or Welsh Toro. But if somebody's willing to spend that money, if they put a product out there at a price and it sells, they're going to put it out there at that price again. If it sells too quickly, they'll put the price up. If it sells too slowly, they'll maybe maintain the pricing or occasionally bring us some special offers or something like that. But if it's selling, even distilleries are businesses. So they're going to put it out there. There are occasions that we are being fleeced. There are occasions that we are being gouged. There are occasions that the whiskey is put on the shelf at cynical, cynical prices. And some of it is, is in such high demand that it doesn't even make the shelf and it moves at cynically high prices. But Welsh, you don't buy those whiskies. I know you don't. I occasionally fall foul, I'll be honest, and I buy them. Despite being preparing for this, 
VPUB tonight, the new Bimber release came out. Now it came out at sixty-five pounds. Is you could argue whether that whether that's high, whether that's the right price, whether it's a, a good price. I think it's north of a good price. I think it's too expensive. It's three years old, maybe four years old at best. Bimber now, whiskey at sixty-five pounds. Now I've tried Bimber. I like Bimber. It's good whiskey to me. And I looked at it, and as I was looking at it and thinking, will I? Um, I I'm not opening my Bimber right now because I'm being a bit precious about it. Yeah, I'm going to just do it. I'm going to buy it and then I've got another bottle of Bimber there that I can open. And I paid £65 for very young whiskey. It's the ex-bourbon one. While I was on the website, by the way, the Oloroso one just sold out. It just disappeared. That slightly higher price, £75. So I know that probably now that Bimber's already gone, I didn't even check. But it's coming, it's on its way. And immediately I thought, Roy, what have you done? You're part of the problem. There's always going to be whiskey. There's always going to be good whiskey. If you feel it's too expensive, don't buy it. And Welsh, I know that that's very much what you do. Helen is saying that sounds like it should be in your quiz. She's talking about the extended capacity, absolutely. Frank Falscraft is saying that Amber Rush is definitely a two-sided thing. When there is a lot of whiskey produced, you will find an increase of epiphany whiskey as well as of rubbish. All whiskey production is up. That's right, the average, the mediocre, the poor, the good. I think, sweeping broad brush statement, I think that generally the consistency is in place now. I think the quality is of a minimum, it's always pretty good. The days of really, really ropey whiskey are probably behind us for the most part. Um, you could argue that that, that kind of homogenizes things a little bit. It dials out that kind of opportunity for some truly special serendipity to come along uh, because of the lack of human input into producing whiskey or whatever, you can argue all of this. But right now, as we've covered in past VPUBs, it's never been a better time to be enjoying whiskey. Actually, is saying, I suspect that people have always been raving about what they love to drink. It is the scale and the reach of that, that that the internet offers that has changed things more recently. Exactly. Like I say, I am part of the problem. Whiskey Weekend Drama is saying, eh, Whiskey Lake, and what about the flippers on the, the new distilleries Bimber in the Netherlands sold out in three minutes? They sold more than they had. Drew from Arizona is saying, whenever you add another layers to the supply chain, you have another entity that will want to take profit like the indie bottlers. Um, I, th I think I think it's, it's true about putting uh, layers in the supply chain. So distributors, exporters, importers, brokers, retailers, and but they all play a part. They, they all do something. I don't think there's there's layers for the sake of layers. Um, but what's really interesting is despite what, if you look at certain releases that are out there, let's take any age you want. You've seen us and the VPUBs that we've talked about, where's the value? We can see where the average price for a 12-year-old is, a 15-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 21-year-old. We've established that Dolwini 15 is by far the best value 15-year-old out. Whether you want to buy Dolwini 15 at its presentation or not, it's neither here nor there. It's the best value. 15-year-old Scotch whiskey that there exists right now. Lagavulin 16 is up there with some of the, the best value 16-year-old. Knockdo 21, as we discovered, is <laughs> probably the best value 21-year-old single malt Scotch whiskey. Now, I bought a bottle of it, and it's a bit, it's a bit simple whiskey, honestly. It's a bit soft, but it's very, very good. And if you poured it for somebody that came to your house, a visitor, or if you gifted it to somebody, they would be very, very happy with it. It's great value. It's maybe not the presentation that we want. We would pay a few more pounds extra to have the ABV up a bit, to have reassurance that it's not been chill filtered, to have reassurance that they haven't added any colour. We would pay a wee bit more for that. But it is what it is. It's a legacy thing. Those malts came out of the days of blends. Everybody was drinking blends. That's why they exist. And Whiskey Weekend Dram, when he's talking about flippers, we are part of the problem. Even if we are not the ones that are flipping, we are part of the people, part of the community that is creating a demand for that whiskey. Can you really judge somebody for seeing an opportunity in the market? 
doing the research, studying it, queuing up from ridiculous hours all over the place, waiting and constantly re refreshing uh, websites, gambling essentially that is going to pay off, and securing whiskey. It, it must be a very a difficult pursuit, honestly, to do that. It's not like they can just walk in, buy a few boxes and put it on a sale at auction. There's effort and risk involved in this. And they found a way to make some money out of it. They don't make money all the time, but it seems like right now, most of the time, they make a bit of money if they do their homework well. How can we, how can we judge that? How can we stop people from doing that? You know, maybe I don't do it. Maybe you don't do it. Maybe we don't like that it happens. But we can't. We There's an opportunity there to make money. And if somebody's willing to do the the work to make the money, we can't stop them. David Ronan said, even though Ryan, everyone, it can be quite confusing sometimes buying whiskey, so much to choose from. Exactly. David Ronan said, even Roy, uh, oh, sorry, I just picked it up. Uh, Rob Halford is saying, what do you think of uh, the new Glad turret range in prices? Is it another Bal Blair money grab? I think it's a wee bit worse than that as well. And clearly what they're doing there with the packaging, Lally conspired, all of this kind of thing, is that they're, they're going for luxury product placement. Very little in the range, and certainly at the prices, speaks to me. I'm curious to try it. Some of the presentation that they put out there was quite interesting. But the prices just take it completely off my radar. Yeah, absolutely. Bal Blair as well. I'm constantly going back and looking at that 12-year-old Bal Blair and wanting to try it. But it, it catches me because I remember what I was able to buy Bal Blair at when it was a vintage, when it wasn't age stated, it was vintage. So the difference is that a vintage is everything is from that year and an age statement will be from a minimum of that age, but potentially some older stuff in there. It is a wee bit different. But it's, I think that the same with Old Pulteney from the same company, Inverhouse, kind of switched off a lot of folk when they rebranded and repositioned. Maybe they're doing quite well out of it. Maybe they're doing very well out of Balblea. Makes me nervous for Anok. Drum Mondays is saying Karchus jumped from $99 to 189 here this year. Prime example. Karchus is Lefroig's annual release. Um, that's a shame. That's a shame. That's a that's a huge jump. Hey, Jimmy Leg looks like Jimmy Legg's bought maybe dram. And he's saying, Aquavite, we are adults. We are responsible for what we do. Complaining is easy. Taking action is what makes the difference. If you think it's too much, don't buy it. I think that that's kind of what I'm coming around to. You know, we, we can whinge and we can moan and we can bemoan the things that are out with our reach. But we are spoiled by choice. The amber rush is real on all fronts. We've never had so many new whiskies to choose from. We've never had so many expressions to choose from. We've never had so many producers, so many producing countries all over the world. We're literally spoiled for choice. And for everybody that is being cynical or gouging us, there is somebody that's stepping up to say, what about this? We've talked this year about producers like Glenn Cadham. We've talked about producers like Anok, still, please, keep it like that, that are showing us that they can make a profit selling a 24-year-old single malt whiskey, a beautiful 24-year-old single malt whiskey, unchill filtered, filtered natural colour, for £114 of that order. Now that tells us immediately Anok is a distillery that's very manual process. It's not highly automated. Look at Kilkerran, 16-year-old whiskey, fully natural, 46%, between 55 and 60 pounds. This is the cost of whiskey. Don't tell me that Kilkerran are not making a profit at that level. Don't tell me that Anok and Verhouse are not making a profit on Anok 24. Don't tell me that Diageo are not making a profit on Dilwini. Like Villain 16 or Knock Do, uh, sorry, uh, Nakandu, 21 year old. These tell us what the actual cost of production, getting it into a bottle, getting it out into the marketplace and distributed, with exceptions, and you can't, it's broad brush things. 
these are the producers that are telling us how much the, what the value of whiskey actually is. So we can we can it's easy for us to apply a little of rational intelligence to this and know when we're paying a wee bit more. Now maybe we have to pay more because of scale, because of care taken to make the whiskey, because of the way it's matured, because of the, the cask quality, the investment in wood, all of these things. But we need to take that moment to pause. My bimber this week was fear of missing out, honestly. I clicked checkout and I just bought it. I should have paused. I hope I don't regret buying that bimber. I hope when it arrives here, I pour a glass and I say, wow, okay, it is, it's 65 pounds whiskey, it's wonderful. I hope that happens. But other people that are not making bimber see that going out there at three or four years old and say, no. Oh, 65 pounds. You could argue that Bimber have earned their stripes by putting out whiskey that people have been raving about and loving. So they have earned the right to be able to sell three-year-old, four-year-old whiskey at, at 65 pounds. Shane is in saying the Amber Rush is real, but it's the individual's choice. Sorry. Uh, oh, yes. Come back. Always this, I start to read something, it jumps. The Amber Rush is real, but the individual's choice if they want to surf on the crest of the wave or be with some of us back in the dinghy. I, I, it's a good analogy, Shane, absolutely. Helen is saying, do you think some of the pricing is getting a little steep? Um, agree with Blair, we're adults, but sometimes we can't help ourselves when that one bottle appears. Let's not beat ourselves up for when that one bottle appears and we pay a wee bit more or a pay, pay over the odds. But I think what I'm getting at here is that if we do it, we have to justify it. It has to be something that does mean a wee bit more. Welsh Torres saying, come on, Roy, it's a money grab. We buy, and but that's what I'm, I don't think you do buy Welsh. You're a canny guy. And one of your mantras is absolutely denying them when the prices go high. Maybe you're just being a bit diplomatic there when you're saying we because I don't think you do, and they put the price up. I've given up on Bal Blair and Pulteney, so you're not. You're so they're exactly what you're saying is you're not buying it. Got a Pulteney fifteen recently, and it's nothing. Stop buying. Okay, so you did buy one, but at least you tried, and now you know. And I think when you pay more for a whiskey, you're asking more of the liquid. <laughs> it can be difficult for the liquid to perform in the glass for you, because you paid a bit more, you're expecting more, and sometimes it isn't more. Does anyone know, says Thomas, when the Aquavite set of six glass, glass toppers will be back in stock? I have ordered them, Thomas. I have, they're on order. Um, everything is difficult to get a hold of right now, lead times and things, because of you know the situation that we're all in. Um, but I'm hoping that they're going to appear in the next couple of weeks, because a lot of people are looking for them for Christmas. So there's another 100 sets going back in. It's a big outlay. I'm hoping that there's demand for it. Um, so they will be going back into stock. Listen, these things hopefully don't go out of date, so I can hold on to them for a while. Um, I'll announce to everybody when they do go back in. When we're on the subject of merch, I want to show you something here. This isn't merch. Well, it's kind of merch, but bear with me. What do you think of this? This is my one of my Infinity bottles. This is my Klein Leashy lead Infinity. It's not only Klein Leashy that's in here. There's some Tinerik in here. There's a wee splash of sherry Dalyun in here. Um, there's bits and pieces, but this is an, an infinity bottle that I've not been topping up because it's lovely. And I'm sipping it and enjoying it as it's gone down. I've, I've made a good job of this one for a change. But look at this. This is a clear label. Um, this sticker, this clear sticker that I've made. I'll put my hand behind it so that you can see it a wee bit better. This is a barfly with the... the the VPUB details around the outside. And down underneath, you can see that there's a tiny wee line that says refill, time to refill. This is the refill level. So the idea is, is that with an infinity bottle, it's not a Solera bottle. A Solera bottle, you would pour a few drams out, then immediately top up again and fill and leave. An infinity bottle, you're, you're making a home blend. And when it gets down to a certain level, you top it up and start adding things again so that you never run out of anything that you've added to it. So that's the idea for this wee label. So I've made a barfly one, and I've made a, an Aquavite, it's not whiskey till it's shared one as well. Um, but the cool thing about it is, I hope, is that you um, 
you can cut the wee fill level bit off the bottom and you can move it down to where the fill level wants to be on your bottle. Um, or you can just discard it and you have a wee circular sticker that you can uh, put anywhere that you where you will. Um, I, I got these because I've got my Infinity bottles all have kind of various stickers and handwriting and bits and pieces on it and we mentions and things. And you can still put a sticker underneath or on the back or whatever, but this just makes it a wee bit more, I don't know, something decorative. Um, so I, what I've been doing with these recently is I've been just the last few merch orders that's come through. And I apologize about merch orders recently because there's not much in the store. There's not a lot happening in the store. Um, I'm just sending out once a week. So if you order on a, like a Thursday or a Friday, it's, it's Thursday's my, my day for going to the the depot. Uh, it's the only day that they're open all day. Um, so I was there today and I, I shipped out all the merch uh, today that I had and I've put some of these in. So anybody that gets these, give me your feedback. And I think what I'll do long term, once, this, once the merch store is stocked up again, is I'll just put these in for free with people that, I don't know, order over £20 or £15 or whatever it is. I'll put them in um, and I hope that you like them too. Scott Clark is here. Good to see you, Scott. Was gutted to find, find Little Queen Margot three-year-old was £14 in Scotland compared to 11 in England. Price gouging. <laughs> He's given me a wee emoji there as well. It's quite funny. £14. I had the Queen Margot on a blind tasting on Sunday night, the lock-in with patrons. That was in a... I did, I'm really pleased how I did in that blind tasting. I was just going with gut instinct and running through it. Yeah, but the Queen Margot was in that lineup. Really not bad for the money. Really not bad. Daniel Vramas is in saying, good idea. Thanks, Daniel. Nice to see you. Actually, is in saying, buy shares in your favourite distilleries. More likely the, the conglomerates who own them. Helen is saying, we'd love the labels for our Infinity bottles. Um, uh, I will have hopefully got plenty of them to go around, Helen, so you should be able to get some. Quincy Clot is saying, my Infinity bottle is still empty, but hope to start filling it soon. <laughs> the next great experiment. Quincy, if you make a mess of it, don't worry. Um, especially if you, when you do make a mess, a wee tip for infinity bottles is that if you do first start to mix things, give yourself a bit of space in the bottle um, so that if in a week or two, a few weeks, it's not settling, it's not rounding out, it's not doing a good job, you've got some room to try and adjust things a little bit. But always be patient, give it time. Almost all the time that you make a blend and taste it immediately, it tastes a bit odd. You need to give it time to kind of round out and marry a little bit in the glass, if that's the right word. Hey, Robert is saying, I've tried to get hold of some Ben Nevis for a long time, but it's very difficult because everything goes to Nika. Ben Nevis, uh, most of it goes to Japan, yes, absolutely. But Ben Nevis, I think they fight hard, honestly, to get enough allocation from the production to put aside to mature uh, for malt whiskey that they are going to be releasing for a malt whiskey, um, either trying to get their hands on mature stock or trying to lay down a new make that they can keep and mature for that purpose. Um, but we do see Ben Nevis coming onto the market from time to time. I don't think it's ever going to disappear completely, um, but you sometimes need to be a bit patient. It's not always around. It's not always to get, easy, to get your hands on it. Joe Prestera is saying, um, I could hear more shirts coming. Yes, so polos have been super popular. This is a Vin polo I've got on tonight with his logo on the sleeve in here. This is a No Nonsense Whiskey shirt. I love this one. So I've got some black polos coming. The navy ones are coming back in. There's a heather grey one coming back in as well with a different colour scheme on it. Um, the, you're going to see the wee barfly guy appear. That wee thing that's up in the top of the screen up here. You're going to see him appear here and there. Um, and, and also, uh, there's a slight twist on the T-shirts as well. There's a, a V-Pub T-shirt, um, kind of Barfly V-Pub Compass-themed T-shirt, and uh, uh, just a, a kind of more generic Aqua Vitae thing. Um, I'll share it all with you when it becomes available. I'm going to have to wait on these things. I was given a minimum four-week lead time for the T-shirts, but I wanted to stick with a supplier that I know is bringing me a good quality print, a good quality shirt, um, and just be a bit patient. It might mean... I'm trying my hardest to get them in so that I give myself some time for Christmas. I know some of you want it for Christmas, but I'll announce to everybody when it's all back in. Said Martin, saying, I haven't bought anything from Aberlour for two years as the value isn't there for me anymore. I will chase a Douglas Lane, uh, uh, old particular bottling though. 
So you're you're moving to where the value is. That is because you're even you've got lo loyalty and sentimental attachment, some nostalgia even. I know the story about you and Abelur, Sid, and yet you've chosen to take a rational, critical thought and step back from it, which I think is only fair. You're finding experiences elsewhere that's bringing you value. Jimmy is saying, yeah, where's my shirt? It's getting cold here. <laughs> I need to work on that, don't I, Jimmy? What was it, 3XL? Neil Cochran is saying, uh, just looking at Balblair 25 at 450, what a bargain. <laughs> Hope this is not a sign of more things to come. Really bonkers pricing, well out of reach. Absolutely. 25-year-old, 450 pounds from the same producer that's putting out Anarch 24 at 115. Now there I am, I'm part of the problem. So what do you think is going to happen? Balblair is going to come down to a more realistic price or Anarch 24 is going to go up? It's inevitable that it's going to go up and we step back. Sorry, Glenn Farkless is doing a 25-year-old for that price. There are blended malts out there, wonderful blended malts. Look out for an upcoming VPUB as we talk about that. That's coming out at much, much more attractive prices as well. There's always going to be ways to work as a community to not get on board with the crazy price rises right and left. £450 for 25-year-old Bal Blair is shocking. £480 for a 28-year-old Fetter Cairn is unforgivable. These are businesses, and they have a right to run their business how they like. Absolutely. We are consumers. We are customers. And we have a right to take our business where we like. There's not a game of, uh, uh, is it a space side? Sorry, there wasn't a game of, is it a space side plan tonight? But I think there will be now. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a shape of what's happening in December quickly as a kind of uh, break off the, the theme, the topic for a wee while. Um, I've been really, really busy trying to piece together December because it's looking like it's going to get quite crowded and quite busy. But it's looking like the shape of December is going to be a tour of space side with guest hosts. I'm really excited about that. Um, we might even see Roddy back on the scene. Um, we're also going to be talking to, uh, we're going to be talking about blended malts, a subject I've wanted to talk about for a long time. I touched on it there, which is what's made me think about this. There's huge value to be had in blended malts, but I want to understand why blended malts exist. I want to understand what makes them so good value. I want to know, understand what what ones are really, really nice and worth pursuing. So who would you have me reach out to for blended malts? Compass Box is obvious, isn't it? But Compass Box, the core range is still good. And here and there, reasonable value. But a lot of the releases coming out from Compass Box are eye-wateringly expensive. There may be reasons for that. But that's not kind of the whiskey that I want to promote. That's not kind of the whiskey that we can all grab, have on hand, have no anxiety about opening it, drinking it, and sharing it. Where would you go to for expert input onto why blended malts exist? Sid Martin's just mentioned them. Douglas Lane, perfect. They've got a big range of remarkable regional malts, and I reached out to them to see if they'd be willing to talk about their philosophy, their reasoning behind the remarkable regional malts. What makes them bring a blended malt to market? We know that Fred was on earlier in the year, hates the use of the word blended, would much prefer the word vatted. I would much prefer that we just call it malt whiskey, honestly, but it's blended malt, that's what it is. So for insight, um, Douglas Lang are going to come on. It looks like it's going to be Stuart Baxter that joins me. Fantastic guy. Uh, used to be at Pernod Ricard. But I also want to ask some of the, the, the more tricky questions. How can you produce a 21-year-old blended malt and make it taste as good as that Rock Island 21, for example, and sell it for less than 80 pounds. How can that exist? Surely it makes more sense to keep this, the individual casks and sell them as single casks. So that's going to be an interesting discussion, and it's going to help us find another avenue there that we can pursue as a community where the value does still exist. And don't tell me that it's not as exciting as the single malt category. It might not give us that surgical ability to dial into individual distilleries, that's becoming less and less of a thing now as distilleries try to make their ranges varied as possible. 
We're moving away from the days where they were making homogenized stock for blending purposes. We're getting much more variety from, from distilleries now. So if it's variety that we're after, what about trusting blenders to put some fantastic malt creations together and bring it at a great presentation and a great price? So that's upcoming as well. I'm also uh, currently in very, very mature discussions with Anthony Wills at Kilhoman. Would love to get the story, the human story from them. Um, would love to get them coming on and sharing how such a thing could exist on Isla as Kilhoman, honestly. I think it's a fascinating story. Over the years, I've read articles from Kilhoman that looks like they were just about to fail. They weren't making enough whiskey. And then the next minute you look at it and you see that um, they're investing and expanding and going through the roof because they're not making enough whiskey. They've been so well received. It's been a fascinating story to watch over the years. So Anthony Wills, I think um, I would hope to see that. And then there's going to be some kind of community focused, maybe blind tasting focused um, thing that I'll do right up close to Christmas. You know, a bit like what we did last year. We can't all get together in the same room. It's really frustrating, but I'll try and do something that's a bit larger scale. Um, so that's that's all been planned ahead. So with all this planning that went on, I forgot to even reach out to anybody to talk about playing as a space side tonight. But somebody is going to drop in and play, and I think you'll have some fun eh, working out who it's going to be. Ross Fudd, that's Thomas, is saying, uh, don't you think the price is also impacted by the quantity of bottles in a run? I can't imagine there's plenty of 25-year-old spirit. <sighs> I think there's plenty of it. I think as the years go on, if it's maturing well, it becomes more and more valuable. So I think the, the tricky part is, Thomas, when to make that decision to actually get it in a bottle and sell it. Um, but if they miss the optimal point, not only can the, I mean, if, you know, we don't need to have it actively in oak, I'm sure. They have to, they have to make the point of, getting out there at its optimal flavour, its optimal point of consumption, and also not sell too much. I'm sure they want to hang on to enough to put mature stock into future products, to have that 30-year-old product or the 28-year-old product or whatever. But I think you might be surprised how much 25-year-old spirit there actually is out there. Having said that, 25-year-old spirit is a very precious thing. Falsgraf is saying, uh, what about bringing both Lane Brothers in the, in the same V-pub? Yeah, that would be great fun, for Falsgraf. I'm sure it would be. Um, Andrew Pierce is saying, definitely North Star. Just posted on the Facebook group about a Vega 33-year-old blended malt I've, I've opened today. Um, £104 was a great buy for that age. Absolutely. So Sirius is another blended malt from North Star and Vega is their uh, sherry style uh, uh, blended malt. And they've been able to, to source some fantastic whiskey in very recent years and bring us amazing, very, very mature, well-aged experiences at very, very good prices. Case in point, probably that 33-year-old. I don't recall trying that one. The Vega I have, Uh, that it's usually sitting behind me. I don't know which Vega it is that I have, maybe the 28-year-old that I have. I've had a few Vegas. Been fantastic whiskies for the price, honestly. Greg is saying, uh, Aquavita, probably because the distilleries are undisclosed, so often limits the price tag. See, for instance, the, the price of Ellie Glen Farkless, probably Speyside's finest 41-year-old. You know, sometimes that's the, the reason for, or sometimes the, the malt that goes into a blended malt would be undisclosed, sure. But that's not always the case. Absolutely not always the case. And it's very easy for them to, and, and like uh, the Douglas Lane range, for example, if you if you pick up uh, Rock Island, it'll tell you that there's whiskey in there from Aaron, Isla, Jura, and Orkney. <laughs> so Orkney, we know where that's from. Jura, we know where that's from. Aaron, we know where that's from. And Isla, we can... May probably make a decent educated guess. Um, but yeah, you could have a point. Kim Bryant is saying, my wife says that this year's books are closed. I am now spending next year's budget. I'm, this, I'm right there with you, Kevin. I'm right there with you. I need to find ways myself. So when I'm talking, I'm just thinking out loud here. I need to find ways myself 
to not become a victim of this amber rush. I don't, I don't want to drive demand up for things that suddenly mean that I can't enjoy them anymore. If I do drive demand up for things, I want to back drive demand for things that are really genuinely deserving of the praise because they're bringing us a fantastic product at a good price. And I share it with you guys. And if it ends up being successful and they make a bit more money out of it, maybe that's, that's an example to how other producers can say, well, how are they succeeding? They're doing this. People are opening it. People are drinking it because guess what? It's affordable. People are sharing it. For whiskey to be desirable, people have to be drinking it. People have to be opening it and drinking it and celebrating it. If people aren't drinking the whiskey, it's just an ornament. It's I know that we're all here because we like to enjoy and drink the whiskey. Eric Waite is saying, what percentage of the price uh, of whiskey is due to taxes? It's huge, Eric, no doubt. If we want to complain about the price, I think we should complain about the government more than the distillery. That'll always be a thing. We'll always be campaigning different taxes, different tariffs, everything. But let's take all of that out of it. Let's take all the kind of black box things out. Let's look at the price of a 16-year-old versus the price of a 16-year-old. Both at similar ABVs, let's say, within a few percentage of each other, perhaps. And let's compare it to others. It's their peers out there in the marketplace. We're not talking about taxes then. We're not trying to dissect why something can end up at that price or whatever. It's easy for us to look at, at producers that can bring us good value. You know, nothing to do with tax or tariffs, import duty, whatever it may be, just just how much it costs to put that product out there. Like I say, don't tell me Diageo isn't making money at Lagaville in 16. Lagaville in 16 seems to have been a similar price for the last 10 years, right? Um, I don't, it's different everywhere. It's maybe different where you are, Eric, but for here, I can buy Lagaville in 16 anywhere between 49 pounds and 65 pounds, let's say. And it feels like it was that price when I first started drinking Lagaville in 16 in 2009, honestly. Graham Fraser, Naked Grouse is such a great, very affordable blended malt. As you know, Roy, how can Edrington put McAllen in a whiskey so cheap? I used it in the blind tasting challenge with the mash and drum, Jason, he had Naked Grouse, excuse me, in the lineup there. Um, and he actually talked about it being a really nice whiskey, and it is. But to answer your question, Graham, it's young. It, it's it's going to be quite, it's nice whiskey, but it's young. Um, a wee bit engineered, a wee bit simple whiskey, if I'm honest. There's not a lot of complexity there. Um, but it is, it's decent. And if you just want something for easy, casual sipping, sharing, throwing it over ice, it's perfect over ice. It, it's a great buy. £19 I paid for Naked Grouse. Chris is saying the problem is that whiskey enthusiasts such as ourselves are in the minority. Companies make whiskey for the market. Now, that's interesting. There have, been, there have been big booms in Scotch whiskey for a long, long time. Like I say, I'm going to talk about Scotch here, and you can pretty much um, ap apply it to the whiskey wherever you are. It's, it's, there's going to be a similar story. But if we wind back further to the late 19th century when Scotch was at its boom because of Victorian, uh, the Victorian um, fascination with all things Scottish, perhaps. The fact that a Scotch had stepped in and took the place of brandy while phylloxera was killing off the vines in Europe. Um, lots of, for lots of reasons, we had that huge boom at the end, end of the uh, 19th century. Then the Patterson crash happens at the turn of the century. We roll into the First World War. We roll into Prohibition, the Great Depression. All these terrible things happen. And before it's even got a chance to start any kind of recovery, we had the Second World War. And then the next big boom comes. Let's call the, the post-war boom the Hollywood boom, right? The, where everybody's kind of got this tumbler full of uh, ice and they're swirling their glass with whiskey in it. It became very, very popular, very desirable post-war. And we saw the same thing happen from about 1960 to 1970. Malt whiskey production doubled in Scotland. The same as what's happened over the last 12 or 15 years. It doubled. Suddenly, we move away from drinking Dewar's, Ballantines, Buchanan's, all of these blends. 
or we don't move away from it, but we start to see a new category appearing. In the early 60s, Glenfiddich appears. Soon we see other brands like Glenmorangie follow, Glenlivet. They all start to produce their own single malts. By the time the 70s rolls around, we've got 30, 40, 50 different whiskies being sold as single malts. McAllen joined the party in the late 70s, 1978 or something like that. And by the 80s, we've got 100 plus supported by the independent bottlers that are bringing us malts from any distilleries that they can get their hands on that make good quality product. And even although the late 70s, the Scotch whiskey, the, because of fashion, honestly, just bombs, malts carry on ambivalent of what was happening to the other whiskies, the blends out there. It was argued back at the time that <laughs> the, the, because it was less than 1% in value and volume, malt whiskey sold as a single malt against blends, less than 1%, they argued that this is a growing sector. We could see growth coming up to about 5%. In the end, they saw twice that less than 5% in volume, but twice that, 10% on value. And that's only grown. Now 10%, at least 10 to 12% of the volume is sold as single malt. And depending on the market that you're looking at, whether it's domestic, global, or individual markets, in the US, the value of whiskey sold to the US, 40% of the value is single malt. It's less in Europe, but less domestically between 30 and 40 globally of the value, still 10% in terms of volume. So we're seeing a different boom this time around. This, endu this enduring boom that we're having that's happened from about, let's say it started in very, very small scale in the late 70s, the 80s. And it's just continuing. It's a premium whiskey boom that we're seeing now. This is what caught everyone out in the 2005 area, right around about that time. And they're just, we started to see non-age statements appear everywhere because there wasn't any mature whiskey. So they had to start putting out non-age statements with younger whiskey in there, rebranding, doing things differently. We saw Dolwini do it. We saw lots of Cardew do it. We famously saw Glenlivet do it. We saw Glenfiddich do it. Glenmonji didn't do it. They kept their age statement. So many of them were going down the route of non-age statement everywhere. As in the background, they're busy, busy squirreling away, extending their capacity, extending their distilleries, adding new stills, bigger fermentation rooms, building completely new distilleries to the point that since there, when they ran out of whiskey to now, they've doubled their volume. What I want to ask everybody now is we're going out there and we're getting in queues and we're refreshing our web pages and we're fighting each other to get the latest and greatest. Where is all that mature whiskey? If it's not out there already, it's coming. And there's plenty of it. One of the reasons that I have not got on board with the Aquavite release of a single cask or a community bottling or a patron bottling or anything is I'm looking at the prices of casks. Some are good casks, some are mediocre, some are poor. And it doesn't matter. They're, they're eye-wateringly expensive. Where is all that maturing product that, they, that they've started? They, they increased their capacity 15 years ago. It's coming. It's got to be coming. Falsgraf is saying, so the single malt thing is growing constantly despite ups and downs in the general market. Blends are flat. Blends have had very good years. They've dropped a wee bit. Again, it depends on the export market. But it's a very broad brush thing. While blends have grown in the last 15 years as well, some would say healthy growth. But compared to the growth in single malt, but blends are relatively flat. And guess what? You know, Russia hasn't exactly opened up its borders or Brazil or India or China. We're not having all these really lucrative trade agreements that we perhaps thought we might buy now. It's not happened yet. So if all of that malt, if all of that increased capacity isn't going into blends, where is it going? Where is it? That's why you consider that it's a little bit like the glass lock. Every, all these bottles that people are buying and keeping sealed in their home, there's only one thing going to happen with that. At some point, that's going to come back onto the market. And as soon as it starts to come back onto the market in any volume, everybody's going to panic and it's all going to come back onto the market. So we're going to get that wave happening there. This is going to be surely the same with all this 
increased capacity that's been happening over the ten, last 10 or 15 years. Pick up the malt whiskey yearbook and pick up an older edition. I've got the 2008 one I've been looking at recently sitting about somewhere. And look at the look at the stats at the back of the book to tell you the capacity, the, the available capacity and what's actually being produced. And they'll also tell you, Scotch, you, you can get the figures from the Scotch Whiskey Association as well. They'll tell you what the exports are, what the growth is, how many bottles are being sold. So, so you can see that the capacity has been made for years now. So, so where is it? Why are we still paying these ridiculous prices? I don't deny that for a long time Scotch whisky was being undersold. There's no doubt it was too cheap for a long time because it wasn't in demand and it wasn't fashionable. Those days are gone. We are now part of the problem. We are now part of the, the, the effect that pushing it beyond what it's actually worth. Some of my favorite producers are doing it. They're asking a bit too much. There's two there's two bottles I want to open tonight. I've been talking too much. I want to open whiskey from a brand new distillery, and I want to share with you an example of fantastic value whiskey that you can buy right now. But I'm going to reach out to my guest who has dropped in at very, very short notice. I did feel like I bullied her a wee bit, honestly, but she's been talking about coming on to play a game of Visit a Space Aid for a long, long time now. But she wanted the timing to be right. And I, she was uh, celebrating a success that she had last night on another channel. And I reached out and I said, well, now it's time for you to come in and have a wee game of Visit a Space Aid. So I'll reach out to her in a second. Jimmy Lights just bought me a dram to say, good luck telling me that I'm not enjoying my whiskey to the maximum for a price I can get, uh, I can afford. Port Charlotte 10, yes. Coquerin 8, yes. Coquerin 12, yes. Springbank 10, yes. Ardbeg 10, yes. Le Legic 10, absolutely. All whiskies I can get in Canada for less than $90. All of those still fall into the category of great quality, well presented, without exception in your list there, good quality whiskies at reasonable prices. So when we want to know how much is a really good, well-presented natural Isla whiskey, less than 10 years old, should be less than 50 pounds. Our beggar shown us that that's the case. Springbank 10. When you're picking up 10 year old whiskies for 22 pounds, it's probably too cheap. I guarantee it's gonna be 40, 43% best. It will be chill filtered and it will have color added. It's too cheap. It's malt whiskey. It's much more precious than that. Come on, give us the natural presentation. Don't take stuff away, don't add things. And we'll pay you extra for that presentation. Look at Springbank 10, 35 pounds thereabouts. We're happy to pay it because it's wonderful. That's how much a 10, 12 year old whiskey should be for that quality. Coquerin 8, fantastic whiskey, cast strength. Port Charlotte 10, again, natural presentation. 50% ABV, I think as well. Great value, Legic 10, nothing to talk about. 46.3%, great whiskey. But this is, a, as a community, we're finding these, we're talking about these. And these are the whiskies that we want to succeed. And if they do a wee rebranding and add another 20, 30, 40% onto the price or more, then we step away. We just step away and we start to not talk about them anymore. Kilco Bryan is saying it's been fashion is being fashionable part of what drives up the cost. I, I think so a wee bit. I've seen so many new releases at a variety of prices this year alone. Look, McAllen are very much chasing fashion and luxury goods, that placement. And they're doing well. In fact, some of the markets that McAllen sell into, if they try and bring better value, if they drop to price, if they made it a bit cheaper, it, it wouldn't be desirable anymore. <laughs> That's a cultural thing that exists out there in the world. We don't talk about McAllen. When do we talk about McAllen? Very, very rarely. It's not for us. It's not pointed at us anymore. So we don't need to participate. There's lots of other uh, whiskies very, very similar to McAllen. Good quality whiskies out there that we can get much, much cheaper. Gary Carew is saying Springback 10 is more like £50 when I've seen it too much, in my opinion. I know. Well, listen, the other thing with Springbank as well is that it's not, it's become that kind of whiskey that you can't just walk into a shop and know that you're going to pick it up. Springbank 10 is more, more, more available than most. But it's one of those things that's it's in demand now, honestly. And that's because of the quality and it's because of the value. It's still excellent. 
I challenge you to have a Springbank 10 and a blind lineup with other 50 quid products. It holds its own. The complexity in a Springbank 10, the richness, the boldness, it's incredible that it can be that good at 10 years old. It's excellent. Mrs. Swift is in Andreas saying, if you can get hold of them, maybe you're talking about um, Springbanks. And Multimission is saying, uh, it is Roy, and it's called Snobbery. Maybe, maybe a wee bit of that as well. Just, you know, how much you pay for something rather than what it's actually worth. Absolutely. Sorry to my guest. I'll, I'll ask my guest to hold up a wee finger. Um, I have to say, I've really been enjoying the energy that's coming out of this channel. It's a relatively new channel. Um, I, I'm going to find out where she is because I don't believe she's in her home country right now, but she's been putting out content. She's been doing live streaming. She's very, very um, friendly, warm, welcoming, and that comes across in her content as well. She's been a bar fly and a member of this community for some time now, and I get the feeling that she's here to stay. And with those credentials, um, I'd very much like to welcome her behind the bar. Uh, in the V-Pub. I'm going to reach out to Shayla at Whiskey Central and say, welcome to the V-Pub, Shayla. How are you doing? I hope I've I'm got doing on. great. How are you, Roy? Okay, I can just about hear you. I can just about hear you. Listen, can you hear me? I bullied you tonight. I apologize. I put you in the spot. Oh, said, yeah. Hey, Shayla. Can you hear me? I have no worries. Okay, we've got audio. There's yeah, no can you hear check tonight. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I There's a little bit of a lag on my side, so sorry about that. Why don't you drop out and come back in? Sometimes it clears it because I've seen you live streaming from where you are and there's no issues at all. Mm. Drop out and come back okay. in, Shayla, and see if it works. It's better that we can see you and hear you. Okay. Try it. We'll do. It's often the case. And in the meantime, I can get this wee bottle ready for opening. Because part of the Amber Rush is a proliferation of new distilleries. Um, i thinking about, if I go back to the time I'm talking about, you know, 2008, that order, there were somewhere in the region of about 100 to 110 distilleries in Scotland, malt, malt distilleries I'm speaking about, whereas now we're getting on for 140, to the point that it's difficult, very difficult to even keep up with how many distilleries there are. The plastic on this one is making it very difficult for me to open. Some of the, the whiskies from these new distilleries when it comes out is pretty expensive. It's pretty pricey and I don't participate. I'm not paying over the odds just because it's a new whiskey. I'll leave that to the collectors. Maybe there's a demand for it. Maybe it's going to sell out. But some new distilleries have overpriced their product, honestly, and they've been left with it sitting on the shelf for too long. Others price it fairly or there's a reputation that it's good whiskey and it sells out quite quickly. This is Nicknean from the Western Highlands, organic whiskey. Uh, this is not the Anier, this is the, the standard uh, first release that came out. Um, and I'm going to pour a wee glass of this and let it sit in the glass for a bit because I've not tried it yet. But I have to say, I thought that this was well presented when it came out and at a good price at £45. Similar to the Ardemurkin, it's close neighbour. There was enough of it released. Okay, it did sell out. It's going to end up at auction for much more. But there's enough of it released for us to get our hands on some. And it wasn't out at an eye gouging price. £45 is expensive enough, thanks for a three, four, five year old whiskey. Let's be honest. But it's fair. And as the inaugural release, they've got to try and get some profit back in. They've got to keep the wheels turning, right? A lot of capital investment. They've been waiting a long time to make some money. I know that they're doing other things like liqueurs and gins and other things maybe, but you can understand £45 is not ridiculous. I just hope it doesn't creep north of that when the core range is established. Let's see if Shyla, is the connection working any better, please? I hope so. I hope so. Yes, that's better. Yay, You're okay, less jumpy too. <laughs> Excellent. It's really nice to see your, your face. It's nice to have you behind the bar, Thanks Shayla, for as well. Me. I should really call you Nick because normally when you're in live, <laughs> I call you Nick. You're, you're, uh, the name and the logo and things, and it's my aging brain, honestly, Sheila. I get confused no from time to time. No worries. Um, but it, it's nice to welcome you. Were you at all nervous about coming on here to do the Is It a Space Side thing? Because yes. you wanted to study first before you come on to do this. Yes. So, um, yeah. yeah, I'm. I so I made a sheet, and it's like 11 pages long. So basically it's like a an if then statement. So if, 
if this a is a no, chance. then you ask this. That if this is a yes, then you ask this. So if I can use that because I haven't memorized uh, it all yet, uh, if I if I can for my first go around, uh, that would be helpful. But if not, I'll I'll give it my best go. Well, what what we have to do then is what we'll do is is do you have a, a co range bottle on hand? Yeah, but I want to ask you the questions. I don't want you to ask me. See that that's that's why it's caused you that anxiety. Then you want yeah. to step up. You want to be the one. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Mike Franklin is in, and he's bought me a dram to say, "Great job last night, Shayla, uh, closing in on four k hours." I'm at so, twenty five hundred. So, so this was you were on a blind challenge. I haven't seen this. You were on a blind challenge last night with the mash and drum. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And you did quite well. I did okay. I so we guessed almost exactly the same for four out of the five. And then on the fifth one, it was a Bardstown, um, I think it was called Copper and King. And it was a sherry finished uh, bourbon. And I had never had anything like that. And it just smelled, I don't know, a lot like raisins. And then Jason said that it might be a Texas whiskey. So I got nervous because I was like, okay, if it's a te Texas whiskey, I thought it was older, but I guess that it was like four years old because I thought, oh, if it's a Texas, it must be younger. So got a little thrown off, but I did okay. So I'll have a wee look at that. That'd be interesting to go back and see. And I have to say, you know that I'm obsessed with blind tasting on this channel as well. Um, and I, but sometimes uh, when you're blind tasting in a, in a in a group, not only are you second yeah. guessing yourself, <laughs> but you're also you've got to be careful that you don't lead other people down the wrong avenues, or they're perhaps at risk of leading you down the wrong avenues as well. I'll have a wee look at that. Be interesting to see. Yes, yes. But tell us before we go on with the game. Tell us a wee bit about you. Tell us a wee bit about Whiskey Central, and. Sheila, you, you seem quite young to me. Are you in your 20s? So what, So not only are you quite young yep, to come in. Uh, so I'm 24. Uh, I am from the States, um, but I live in Mexico. Um, and then I do a whiskey review channel. So I do scotches and bourbons and rice and Irish. So, yeah. Now, no, so not only did you get into whiskey at a relatively young age then, you need to tell us a wee bit about that, but you also chose to step onto YouTube and share your experiences on camera. How did you get into whiskey, Sheila? So uh, I was 21 <laughs> um, and I was at a bar and I had uh, Jameson, but I wasn't like, I'm not like one of those party people. So I wasn't like taking shots of Jameson. I was just kind of sipping it. I was, I was having a beer and a Jameson, like, I don't know, shot, but I was sipping it. Um, and normally I don't like hard alcohol, but I liked that. So I thought, oh, maybe whiskey's my thing. Um, so I kind of started drinking whiskey. Um, and then I'm kind of a nerd. So I kind of, I don't know, I just started researching and I uh, kind of got down the rabbit hole. Um, and then I was reading mostly articles, uh, but then I thought, oh, maybe there's like YouTube videos about this and uh, kind of found that there's a whole whiskey tube community. Um, and I thought it might be fun to make videos. I was already doing a lot of research, so I figured I should kind of like share it with somebody. So yeah. Your channel's doing very well. What, what, how's the channel going now? Uh, so I'm at uh, 1.7 thousand, somewhere around there. But that's been fast growth because I think you only start, did you start last year or this year? I started uh, like four months ago or so. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's been crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's been great, great fun as well. And obviously, they just I think I think it's the accessible energy that you bring, the kind of friendliness, the approachability. Um, and I think that that makes it very, very easy and enjoyable to engage with as well. Oh, thanks. Um, so, I very best of luck. Let's, um, if anybody, if any of my mods are in tonight, I haven't, uh, yeah, Gregor is in. If anybody wants to grab our Sheila's, uh, channel link and drop it in the chat so that anybody that doesn't know Sheila, most of our community will know Whiskey Central, Sheila by now, uh, they can give her a wee sub. Alistair, thank you very, very much. He's already dropped that in uh, and asking uh, anybody that doesn't know Sheila to go give her a sub. Wow. You're doing live streams now as well, yes? Yeah, yeah. So I'm doing a blind flight uh, every week, um, which is pretty terrifying, but <laughs> um, I'm starting to get okay at them. So Listen, I think the biggest thing about blind flights is that to remember that obviously you can have fun testing yourself, honestly, but first and foremost, it should always be the whiskey that's on test. Yes. Always yes. be the whiskey. Um, good stuff. So does this mean, Do you, I tell you what, do you want, I, 
why don't you grab a core range bottle and I'll I'll go first. Okay. Okay. And, well, and that um, means that then then we're giving away two coins to the community tonight and not just one. A anybody that can play along in the chat, anybody that guesses it, whether it's before we guess it or after we guess it, whatever, uh, can snag themselves a little clear uh, glass topper, um, a sniper coin. These, as I say, they can't be bought. You have to come on and win them. Um, why don't why don't I have a go first, and then then you can have a go. Okay. Does that sound? So okay. Um, well, okay. The the thing is, everything that I have is going to be way too easy for you. So I can just I'll ask. I can do it twice with you if you want. You can like. Pick well, well, handicap me. We'll put a three minute timer on, <laughs> and and we'll I'll, I'll drop a question. Okay, dear. All right. And, and, and okay, what you have to on. remember is that sometimes it's maybe it's the most ubiquitous easy ones that will catch me out. Okay. Okay. Um, let me see. I can't remember who owns this one. Um, ch -ch -ch, hold on. Um, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> That's okay. And I, um, I do appreciate you being able to drop in at the last minute. I'll Hold jump on. into the see what the barflies are doing. Uh, Phil and Deepa, whiskey mystery. Yeah, I'm yeah. saying, uh, young boy is trying to be uh, helpful, going sure, first, sure. but she is all set for her plan. <laughs> yeah, listen, if I'm derailing things, we can just go right ahead with with what you had planned. That would probably be fair. <laughs> I know that you. Yeah, I'm like, let's do it. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not ready. I didn't uh, I didn't write down what uh, all the details that I would have liked to have for, for this. So. <laughs> okay, I, I tell you what, we'll go with me and we'll go with the original plan. Um, I'll pull I'll pull up the, the the little countdown here. I'll take I'll take away I'll chop my first question off, okay? And okay. I'll start my timer at three minutes. And I have. Oh, so, so can I, can I just ask you? Is it okay? Yeah. Like it would you, be you, easier for me if I just asked you. Absolutely. I have a co range bottle on hand, Sheila. I've got it here down okay. next to me. I'll bring it up. So okay. it's the only one that's in front of. I just don't want to have it appear on camera at all. I'll pop it here. All right. Um, and you can. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm confusing things. I'm. I'm setting up as if it's for me. You get ten yeah. questions. Um, and you don't, and you don't, you're not going to be on timer. I do apologize. Okay. You're, I appreciate you're, that. See, I'm not used to. I've been the one that's been asking for so long. This is going to be nice for a change. Yes. Yeah. You have a little break. A break for tonight. Okay, Sheila. When you're ready, uh, go right ahead. And good luck. Okay. All right. So the first one. So I just have my sheet of questions on the on the side. So uh, first one is: Is it a space side? No. Okay. Is it a Highland? It is a Highland, yes. Okay, okay. All right, and I'm going to steal your question because it's a really good question. If we use Dalwini as a center point, is it north of Dalwini? No, it is not no. north okay. of Dalwini. Okay. Let me get to the if it's no section. <laughs> okay, is it a Glen? It is not a Glen. Not a Glen, okay. If this if this flowchart yeah. process of elimination that you've structured here works out, you'll be able to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I thought I just love this game so much, and I was like, I want to make you know, like that guess who game. I don't know if you remember that. There's like these little flipper boards, and you'd say like, does does he have black hair or whatever? Guess I want to. Yes. Ones. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody made a joke last week, actually, that, that the reason that I managed to get, I was on the ropes twice last week and I managed to pull it out at the last second. Mm -hmm. And somebody actually mentioned that. I think it might have even been Neno said that I have literally a guess who board in front of me with all the distilleries on it and I'm just flipping That would be down. awesome. That would be awesome. Um, okay, so it's not a Glen. Is it 43% ABV or lower? No. No. Okay, hold on. Okay. Oh, this this narrows it down quite a bit. Good. So okay, so it's not forty three percent or lower. Okay, so oof. Let's see. Let's see. Um, is it a Deanston? 
Yes. Okay. Is it age stated? Yes. Okay. Is it the Deanston 12 year? No. Okay. So that must mean there's another one. Um, is it the 18 year? Yes. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Deanston, 18 years old, 46.3%. Southern <laughs> Highland, not a Glen. You didn't even need to ask um, about uh, who they, was it one of the big four or anything like that? Greg has been talking about that it should be the big five and I should include Beam Suntory. Yeah, so it's uh, funny. I actually, uh, for Highlands, so I, I went through all your is it a space sides and I was like, okay, on, on space side, it makes sense to ask that. But I don't think it actually makes sense to ask on is it a Highland because there's only a few that are Diageo, Edrington, Grants, or um, I can't even remember the other one. Um, Inverhaus, or no, uh, I don't remember, but. Um, uh, we, we, we usually say so now, uh, Grants, Edrington, Diageo, and Pernod Ricard. Uh, Which is Shiva's yeah, brother. Yeah, Shiva's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so uh, cool. do you know, so I, you need play, yeah, I need I'll access you to your document now, right? If you've got a cheat sheet, you have to keep that under lock sure, and key. Sure, sure. <laughs> Jimmy Legg is saying, if, then code for the win. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I have to say, you did it You did it quite convincingly. I haven't sent it to anybody. So. I'm sorry? We're, we're losing the connection a wee bit oh, as well. Oh, I'm sorry. I think there's a little bit of lag. Shyla, you've easily, comfortably won yourself a sniper coin. Um, I don't know if I have your address already. Perhaps I do. I have an address for you, but I'm happy to ship this wherever Woo! you are. Um, and uh, and I'll also ship it out to whoever. Uh, Menno, Mal Menno's multi-mission is the awesome. winner tonight. So I think Menno's already uh, won a sniper coin before, but he's welcome to another one. Congratulations, Menno. Shyla, are you going to hang about for a wee while and come back in and join us for the quiz at the end, or are you otherwise busy? Yeah, yeah, Shayla. I can I can hang around for sure. Okay, excellent. If, if you do, uh, drop out and drop back in again and see if you can refresh the connection a wee bit because I can see that we've got another wee delay, another lag. Ah, okay. Okay, but and, and just hang about and then at the quiz at the end, I'll bring you back in and hopefully you're able to participate with all the other barflies. Sheila, congratulations okay. on the channel. You're doing amazing things. That's amazing growth in such a short space of time. It shows that there's an appetite out there for the content that you're bringing. I'm very pleased to have you as part of my community as well. And thanks for stepping up so bravely thanks at the last so minute and honestly kick, knocking it out of the park. <laughs> it's been a long time since we've ended this oh, snipe it. that early in the game. Well done. Thanks. Cheers, Roy. And I'll see you in a little minute. Cheers, Sheila. Tell me, am, am I pronouncing your name right? Is it Shayla, Shayla, Shay Shayla? Shayla. 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 Shayla, yep. A apologies for every time I've butchered it. <laughs> it is okay. Don't worry. I'll see you soon. Thanks, Shayla. All Thank right. You. See you. Wonderful stuff. Can you believe that? She's knocking on for, uh, you know, she'll be approaching 2,000 subs before Christmas and she's only been putting out content. It shows that if you're putting out content that's engaging and people want to watch, and you're interacting and thinking about the content that you're putting together, there's an audience out there for you on YouTube. Fantastic stuff. Uh, multi, multi, men was saying, please, please give it to someone as an extra. Already have five. You're chasing the Sniper King there. Uh, Menno, you nominate somebody that you want to ship it to, and I'd be happy to ship it to anybody that you like. Um, and Greg is saying, by the way, the French context, we don't spell the D uh, uh, in the final part of Pernod Ricard. So it's, is it Pernod Ricard then? I always say Pernod without the D. So you're saying it's the, the D in Ricard isn't there? Um, just to let you know and impress next French people you meet, lol. Thanks for keeping me right, Greg. I would like to try to pronounce things the right way, but um, as a non-native speaker, it can be tricky at times. Uh, David Owen is saying good good night. Thanks for dropping in. David, he's off to bed now. Catch the rest tomorrow. Good night. Hi. So if we're talking about uh, what we do, what we do as a community about this whole Amber Rush thing, 
we are in control of very, very little of it, certainly as individuals. But as a larger community, we do have a wee bit of say in it. And I think I'm going to try my very, very hardest over the course of this winter, Christmas time, and into next year, and over the course of next year, to put the brakes on a little bit. The fear of missing out is just another way of saying, leave it for somebody who really, really wants this, for, for whatever reason they want to have it. Maybe they want it as part of their selection collection. Maybe they will open it at some point. Maybe they're going to put it as part of their collection. It's going to complete part of something that they're passionate about that they're collecting. Fine. Maybe they're going to resell it. Maybe they're buying it as an investment. It doesn't matter. Let them have it for whatever reason it may be. If it's a wee bit expensive, if it's in demand, if there's a fight for it, step back. I know that Twain said that too much good whiskey is barely enough. But believe me, we are living in wonderful times right now to be enjoying whiskey. There is, there is almost too much good whiskey. There's plenty to be going around. As I sip this Nicknean, there is no way, and I, I challenge anybody that's enjoying it right now, I know that it's difficult to get a hold of, as I sip this Nicknean, there's no way you would pick this up and, and uh, interpret it as a three-year-old whiskey. I don't think so. There is a bit of youth on it. There definitely is. It's still spirity. But it's just lovely, graceful, appealing, well-crafted whiskey. It's even elegant. Lots of lovely ginger spice, warm, light pepper spice. It's fruity, ripe fruit, tropical, long finish. Spirit driven, honestly, I would say. Not a lot, not a lot of jagged edges. The youth is there, but it's in check. This is a good whiskey. I'm very, very glad to have this. Good presentation as well, 46%. Non-chill filtered. Love, lovely bottle, actually. I know that now it's going to be difficult for you to get a hold of. I don't know if some of it is going to make it to your market. I don't know if you will be in the secondary market for this now. But at least they've tried to make enough of it available at a reasonable price at £45. And they've honestly brought out something that's really quite nice. But let me give you an example of something that is really quite fantastic. I bought a bottle of this a couple of years ago for £55, special offer. Um, about a year or so ago, it appeared back, a special offer for £55, and I bought it then. That's the one I'm going to open tonight. And just last week, somebody, I don't even remember who it was, I apologise, pointed out to me that this was now available again on special offer for £55. It's age stated, 18 years old, 46.3%. Ex bourbon matured. It says first fill bourbon on the label, but I think that that's a re rack. I think that, that it's spent the last few years in first fill. I, I, I think it's been in refill potentially before. I'm not really sure. I need to check that out. But this is Deanston, 18 year old, £55. Now, I don't agree with some of the pricing that's coming out of Deanston now. Some of their special releases, some of the things that you used to be able to pick up their distillery for £65, £75. Excellent stuff. Really interesting stuff is now making its way onto the market for triple figures, sometimes ridiculously north of triple figures now. So that's the kind of Deanston that I'm just going to step back. I'll leave that to the collectors. I'll leave that to the real fanboys. I'll leave that to the people that's prepared to pay £140 for something that in very recent memory I was able to pick up for £50. I'm speaking about Deanston's 2008 Bordeaux cask, cask strength Deanston. 2008 vintage from a Bordeaux cask. Wonderfully fruity whiskey. Lots of red currant tannins, red fruit. Great whiskey, especially with a wee splash of water. I paid £50 for it. Now, that's not available just now, but if that appeared on the market just now, there's no way it would be. I think it would be at least 
double that price. It's too much. This is where the value is from that distillery. And I'll go one further and I'll argue that this is where the character is. This is where the real Deanston is. I have to say that one of my favorite Deanstons is a 15 year old organic, it's a wee bit more expensive. It's really got that kind of spirit driven, uh, uh, spirit first uh, thing going on in, at Deanston, from Deanston. And it's been a while since I've opened the 18 year old, so, so let's see how this is going. But for 55 pounds, Typically, it's about £70. Wow, there's even a nice dunnage kind of funk. There's a dusty kind of nice. That's a surprise. It's a neck pour. I've only just cracked this bottle open, as you've seen. So what we're doing here is after the, after the youth, probably, of that nickname, on the nose, we're getting the, that extra 15 years, honestly, in the cast coming across. But it's still bright and fresh. It's very tropical. It's very fruity. Nice ripe fruit. A lovely kind of boiled Werther's original um, for the folk that know what that is, but like a nice caramel, a nice sweet boiled. Maybe maybe even a toffee eclair type thing. Maybe even a wee bit of chocolate now that I'm in this confectionery aisle. Definitely milk chocolate. The fruit is kind of, it's ripe fruit, banana. So I'm, I'm looking for the malt and the dough and the breadiness that I usually get on Deanston. It's kind of, the cask is, is a bit louder than that here. Maybe if I left it for a while, maybe the spirit would come out, maybe that doughy, bready maltiness would come out, but cheers, 55 pounds. One day, I'm going to compare that to this. I've had this in my collection for six years, something like that, five or six years. So if I go back to when I bought this, an 18-year-old Deanston that I purchased, let's imagine I purchased it in 2015. This is going to be a 1990s Deanston that's in here. Now, the changes had already started to happen around that time. But the changes at Deanston have been huge. At every step of the process, it was improved upon. So now in 2020, when we have an 18-year-old Deanston, it's going to be a lot more of that new, better-made product, product that's been put together with the view, the end goal of being making it available as a single malt. This is me speaking out loud with my own opinions. I'm perhaps wrong, but it's what I believe. And in my opinion, Deanston has gone from mediocre to fantastic in the last decade or so. Look at the 12-year-old. Look at how people are celebrating Deanston 12. Now the 18 is of an age that it's the same product. I think if we compare these two, my suspicion is that this will be a significant jump in quality. One day I'll do it. I don't have time to do it tonight, but it's going to be an interesting thing to open this older bottle. An interesting thing to do one day. Very happy with this. Ridiculously happy with this for, for this price. You would probably normally pick this up between 16 and 75 pounds. At 55 pounds, there's nothing to argue about. Actually, St. Deanston 18 is 99 euros in France. Why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why? Maybe you'll have that. And that's the difficulty when I talk about these things. I know that in different markets all over the place, they maybe just see the 18 year age statement on there and they pitch it at that price. I don't know what's happening, but that time it's gone through distribu distributors and God knows what else actually. But if you're ever over in the UK, you might be able to pick it up a bit cheaper. Hey, Alistair's saying, look forward to trying the new Scarabus 10 and batch strength, hopefully same great value. That's right, Hunter Lane have brought out um, a, a batch strength Scarabus and a 10 year old Scarabus. Um, Listen, I was a bit cynical about the Scarabus thing when it first appeared. I, they sent me a bottle for nothing, um, and I talked about it. I talked about the fact that I don't accept free bottles and things. Um, and I, instead of me raving about that, talking about it, I decided to make it work, and I put it into blind tastings. 
you know this because you've seen the blind taste things happen. You've witnessed it. It even made it into the blind taste thing I put together for Bart on the Scotch Test Dummies when it got put in there with a bunch of other peated only scotches and Bart didn't know what he was sipping. And it ended up being fantastic. We believe it's Kalila, perhaps. We, I don't honestly know what it is. To me, it plays like a lack of villain. The Scarabus, the original Scarabus that came out. Um, but as long as they're bringing good quality whiskey at a good price, that's exactly what we want to uh, to celebrate. And uh, Shyla's saying, I'm so glad I got a sniper coin, finally. Woo. I'll get it across to you, uh, uh, Shyla. Fantastic, well done. Neil Cochran is saying the newer Deanston is better. Palo Cortado 12 was better than the 21. Palo Cortado 12 was lovely, rich, and almost savoury at points. It almost, at times, it, there's flashes of Campbelltown in that Palo Cortado 12. Um, maybe you wouldn't agree with me there, but you might see what I'm what I'm thinking of. Glenn is dancing mid saying, I'm a fan of Deanston, but the expensive stuff, not sure. The 1218 organic, all fab. I agree fully. I love the texture as well. Uh, Graham Fraser is saying, Deanston have just released a seven-year-old cast-strength sherry distillery exclusive at £55. Okay, so they're coming out with young cast-strength whiskey at £55. That is kind of, that, that's reasonable. Maybe if you argued, if you compared it to Coquera and 8, maybe you could argue that it's five or ten pounds more. But that's kind of, that's a nice prospect, an affordable prospect. Seven-year-old cast-strength product, sherry cask, £55. Aberlour Abuna, some of the batches of Aberlour Abuna could be as young as seven or eight years old. We were happy and celebrating when Aberlour Abuna could be bought for £50. We can't buy that for that money anymore. That's kind of the more the stuff that you want to celebrate. That's what we will evangelise about and share. But distillery exclusives that we have to pay £110, £120, £140 for, not so much. That makes it precious liquid that people don't open and share and rave about. They're, they're, they, they're very, very persimmonous with it. They're sip by sip. Special occasion whiskey it becomes. And that's not what Deanston was for me. Deanston was a, was a drinking whiskey that you could celebrate and enjoy, and enjoy very much like this 18. Fastcraft is saying, talking about value, the most low-priced Lefroy yet, Select, turns out to the best I have tasted up to now. The problem with Select is that one batch is unrecognisable from the next. The worst Lefroig I've ever had is a Select, honestly speaking. I've also had some half-decent Select that's okay. Um, it's nice, Falsgraf, that you managed to get a good Lefroig Select. How are we doing for time? We're probably doing terribly for time. 25 past 11. Have I taken care of all the, the housekeeping and everything? Probably not. Um, I'm very, very grateful to you for sitting here and listening to my opinion on these things. Anybody that comments or has an opinion or has some feedback Leave comments underneath the video below. I, I am a wee bit behind. I will go back to last week's. Lots of comments come in from last week's, and I will reply to every comment that's left on a live stream. I, I'll make a, 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 a real effort to do that because I know how many of you pick this up on the replay, and I really, really do appreciate it. If you leave comments underneath, it might take me a few days, but I'll get to them, and I will reply to them. Thanks for the info, as Falsgraf is saying, and Dave Cummins is saying, it only takes 10 minutes in the VPUB. Uh, I'm so ready to visit Scot Scotland. Dave, so this is Dave Cummins, who the last time I spoke to Dave was yet to take a sip of whiskey, yet to enjoy alcohol for the first time, and he's a similar age to me. This year was going to be the year that, that we went to Glen Goyne together, and we could sit down and enjoy his first ever sip of single malt at Glen Goyne Distillery. Dave, I hope that happens for you. This year has been brutal for everybody and it's trashed so many plans for everyone. I hope that one day we can realise that we project together. I was looking forward to welcoming you on these shores this year for that thing. First of all, Whiskey is in. He's just about to go, but he's saying he's really enjoyed the stream. Always appreciate your contribution to the Whiskey community. First Phil Whiskey, he's got his own content, his own channel down there in New Zealand, doing fantastic, very highly polished stuff. I would like to see a wee bit more of it, Phil, but that's the portal calling the, the kettle black. It was good to see you in, my friend. I know it's very early in the morning for you, so it's nice of you to have hung out with us for a wee while. Jamie Williamson saying, uh, sorry, Roy, you can't justify three to four-year-old whiskey, then slam distillery exclusive pricing. Sorry. <laughs> if you make the effort to go to a distillery 
I know that this is an this is an exceptional year. I understand that, James. I really do. We can't get to this the distilleries easy, but if you make the 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 journey to go to the distillery, you should be able to interact with things that people don't normally get and get it at a fair price. You don't make the the effort to have a pilgrimage to the distillery and then get gouged on price. So I'm not sure what you mean. Then suddenly they decide that yeah that's fair, so we'll put the product out there and we'll put it out there at a price that's 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 fair. Um, and people can pick up something that's really quite nice. Then COVID comes along and they say, okay, now we need to sell us. We need to make it available online. But it, wait a minute, it makes it makes our other products look expensive. Oh dear, what do we do? We jack the prices up on the distiller exclusive stuff. It's too expensive. These that are an established distillery, they've been going for a long time now. They've got a well-established uh, core product out there, like so many other distilleries. So if you're talking about me justifying £45 for this at 46% and then having a go at something else for a similar price, I'm hoping that as this matures, and this is small scale stuff, this is their inaugural release, I'm hoping that in time this doesn't get any more expensive, that this stays good value. It looks like a new name. John, if it is a new name, I welcome you in. Sorry, it's not John, it's James Williamson. Service Alaf is the same, uh, finishing off Buna from Douglas Lane, a 10 year old Peated from the Providence series. I don't want to single out Douglas Lane again, but has anyone noticed the prices of independent bottlings? It used to be the, the case that independent bottlings were sitting alongside their official releases and they would be the same price or cheaper, normally cheaper. But now, Another symptom we're seeing of this amber rush is I'm really shocked to see a lot of the independent releases more expensive than the official releases. Really? Is that because they're better? Maybe. Is it just because people are willing to pay the price? Go back to Welsh Toro's comment. Tom's Dram is saying, randomly sipping on a Deanston 18 just as you announced your Dram Slancher. I hope you're enjoying it, Tom, as much as I am tonight. Let's get this quiz on the go. Let's hope that uh, Shayla has a better connection. She's been dropping in and out, so I think she's seen a wee bit of uh, difficulty with the connection at your side, Sheila. Is it okay? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yes, it's okay. perfect right now. Let's go with it. Let's see if it works. All right. Let's see <laughs> the quiz. You know this. You know the story for the quiz. It's fully optional, a multiple choice. You don't need yep. to share your score if you don't want to. I probably um, won't. <laughs> but, um, I'll add this to the stream. You can see that, Sheila. Yes. Yes, and uh, if I if I get bad, just uh, just boot me in, and no worries. <laughs> you won't be booted, but I okay. perhaps won't prod you to share your score. Okay, I, I might okay. ask you a couple of times to give me your answer, but I'd, you know I'll, I'll have a gut feel from your expression whether I, I think you know the, the answer or not. Okay. What's your normal scoring in the quiz? What would you normally target um, for a good score? So sometimes I do well and get like eight out of ten, but most of the time I get like two out of ten. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay. Well, let's target the pass mark of five out of ten tonight, okay? For sure, for sure. There, um, it was a couple of weeks ago I did this. I actually put these questions to, together before Menno came on and hosted the quiz. Mm -hmm. And then I switched it out last week because I did the three-year theme for the three-year celebration last oh, week. Okay. So these questions, I don't even remember what's in here. Okay. I'm hoping they're safe and intact. I should have <laughs> yeah. revised them. No worries. Okay, let's have a go on the quiz. Good luck, everybody. Remember, it's, you're only playing against yourself. It's multiple choice. Only share the answers and scores if you want to. And I'll try and shout out uh, who's doing well in the in the lounge. Good luck. Question one. A recent release from Glenlivet peaks curiosity at 48% ABV. 12-year-old and unchill filtered, but what's it called? I'm hoping I'm starting quite easy tonight. Uh, a, a recent release from Glenlivet is A, the bootlegger, B, illicit still, C, Hidden Spirit. This is interesting because we know that Glenlivet 12, um, certainly in the UK, is presented at 40%. So it's chill filtered, probably a dot of colour added there as well. And at some point, uh, the 12 year old disappeared from our shelves as well. But now, not only have they brought back their age statements in a much more robust range from Glenlivet, they're actually stepping into, they're putting a toe in the water here of much more interesting presentation an unchill filter 12 year old at 48 percent and i picked this up at a really decent price of 38 pounds can you tell me what it is shyla 
Uh, so I have B. I think I've seen it, so. You think it's B, illicit still? Yeah. It's maybe not available in your market yet, but yeah. absolutely right, it is the illicit still. Uh, I had it around here at my feet, actually, I still do. Uh, I've been sipping this, I'm probably about a third of the way through the bottle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, as I've mentioned before, it, yeah. at 48%, it's quite a surprise. There is a bit of heat there. It does take a wee bit of water quite well, but I love the fruit. It's much fruity, much fruitier. Um, then I remember the last time I approached a Glenlivet 12 and I'm just um, I'm pleased to see that presentation coming out at an affordable price at £38 honestly yeah. I think it's a good direction for them to take I hope it appears near you soon Shayla. Question 2 the original 1988 release of Lagavulin's 16 year old is also known as what? This is when it was part of the original classic malts um, what really redefined the whole concept of regionality in single malt whiskey back in 1988 all of the original classic malts from 1980 are still available today, but when it was first launched, what was it also known as? It was Lagavulin 16 all also known as A, the Classic Malts Edition, B, the Royal Warrant Edition, or C, the White Horse Edition? Would you be guessing this one, Sheila? I would be guessing. I know what the six classic malts are, but uh, I, I don't know. Um... Maybe C. You can, but I know that you won't want to. You can use the lounge to guide you a little bit because we have a very knowledgeable crowd, as we know. What would you go with if you were to guess? Uh, I would say C, but I don't know. <laughs> you think that the original, <laughs> the original Lagavulin 16 from 1988 and up until certainly the... Uh, early 90s was indeed known as the White Horse Ooh, Edition. Okay, that was a guess, but it sounded kind of familiar. So I'm wondering if when I was researching, maybe I, I, I read that somewhere. But it says White Horse Distillers on the label. There is also a Royal Warrant on the earlier expressions as well. The really early ones, the ones that came out in the early 80s, uh, sorry, early 90s, late 80s, uh, had gold leaf instead of embossed glass as well. Okay. Question three, I'm going to give you three distilleries and I'm just yeah. asking for the one that is not Tasmanian. Okay. I would have slipped up on this, honestly. Not the Tasmanian distillery. Hellier's Road, Starward or Lark? A, Hellier's Road, B, Starward, C, Lark. Which of those is not Tasmanian? Okay, I'm going to guess B, but I have no idea. You're going to guess B. I like to see. That's maybe the, the, the what you did with the blind tasting on Jason's channel. You just went with your instinct <laughs> yeah. straight away. <laughs> Actually, is saying he needs to quit while he's ahead. There's good scoring happening in the in the lounge tonight. And absolutely, Shayla, you've got three out of three so far. You're doing well. Awesome. Starward is the one I was looking for. Hellier's Road and Lark. I have both. a book uh, that talks about you know world distilleries and. The other one sounded kind of familiar, so that's, I was just guessing. But. Instinctive. Excellent. Question four. 1985 was a bad year for Campbelltown. Why? Mm -hmm. 1985 was bad for Campbelltown whiskey because A, all of its distilleries were closed. B, it lost its status as a region. Or C, they had three separate warehouse fires. Okay, so is it okay if I guess now or? Give, we'll give the lounge. Yeah, you can guess anytime you like, honestly. <laughs> Just go right ahead if you're feeling, <laughs> you feel confident or is this a guess? But I think this is a guess. I, I'm going to go with C. I, I feel like it hasn't ever lost its status as a region. And there's all, I feel like there's always been at least like a couple operating. So I'm just going to guess C, but... Also a guess. <laughs> we'll see. Three separate warehouse fires. I can tell you that 1985, wow. oh all of the Campbelltown distilleries were closed. How crazy. Springbank had closed its doors. Glen Scotia had closed its doors. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was a bad year in 1985. We're very, very grateful that Campbelltown as a region is back uh, yeah. firing on all cylinders again. Wow. 
Eric Waite is saying, 1985 was bad because I was only 19 years old and could not buy whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> you could if you were in the UK, Eric. Um, Dancing Midgey, 4 out of 4. Chris and Mir, 4 out of 4. Lots, so many people on 4 out of 4. Maybe we'll get a good score and a couple of 10 out of 10s tonight. Uh, let's go to the image halfway through. Clearly, I'm looking at a distillery, and it's a new distillery. You can tell by the, the scene there. It's a brand new distillery. But what new distillery are we looking at? A, Dalmunic and Speyside, B, McAllen and Speyside, or C, Lag on the Isle of Arran? Oh, okay. Oh, um, I'm going to guess A. I know it's not B. Um, and I thought Aaron was the only one on Aaron or Arran, um, but maybe there's a new one. So I'm going to guess A. There is. Uh, in, in the north of Arran, we've got the original distillery, which is now called Lochranza. But we also have a new Aran distillery on the south of the island okay. um, that's, that's set up purely to, to make peated product. The yeah. chat know this. They're having an easy time tonight. Precarious Dave is in tonight. Good to see you, Dave. Um, scoring well. Dalmonic in Speyside, built on the site of the old Imperial site. McAllen is a new distillery as well, built on the site of its original uh, distillery. And lag is brand new Greenfield Distillery, and it is indeed Lag. Okay. Unfortunately, Shayla, it's Lag Distillery in the south of Arran. No worries. I usually do really good on the picture questions because I have like my whole background on my phone is uh, is pictures of distilleries, and then it has the name <laughs> of the distillery underneath. So I do like I do uh, just so I can get that question right. But uh, darn it! Oh well. Such a whiskey student. Fantastic. Wonderful stuff. Question six, Kilkerran's new 16-year-old contains 4% what? So 90, 96% uh, ex-bourbon, 4% A, Madeira cask, B, Marsala cask, or C, Amontillado cask. Please note the banana skin. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to guess C. I feel like I've heard you talk about Amontillado, so I feel like Madeira and Marsala are too easy, but... So I'll go with C. Going with instinct. Actually is saying Aquavite nerd alert. <laughs> Ronald is celebrating yeah. pass mark already. He's a happy man. Well done, Ronald. Che Francis is thinking it's Marsala cask B. Alistair Gray thinks it's A, Madeira cask. Okay. Shayla thinks it's C, Amontillado. I can tell you, Shayla, that it is unfortunately B, Marsala. Okay. Now, there is actually information and reviews out there that talk about it having Madeira. But I was on a live tasting with Coquerin quite recently, and I just asked them straight out what the, the makeup was. Mm -hmm. um, so the, 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 the reviews that talk about it being 4% Marsala seem to be the ones that are correct. That's why I put the banana skin in there, because there is a lot of information out. There may have been an earlier release or something, or a different release, a slightly different take on it that had Madeira, but uh, the large-scale release. Uh, I understand to be 4% Marsala. And delicious it is too. Question seven, according to their website, which of these is a lowland distillery? Please pay attention to the banana, everyone. A, Lag, B, Tullibarden, or C, Glengoyne? Huh. Um, so... According to their website, which of these is a lowland distillery? This was pointed out to me by a member of the community in a comment from a previous VPUB. And uh, I went back and checked it out, and it seems to be the case. I was very surprised, and I, I approached them directly to ask about it. And uh, yes, the... Um, yes. Oh, interesting. Okay, so this, is, this will be a total guess as well. Um, maybe... Maybe B. I don't know anything about lag, so uh, clearly. Uh, so I'll just go with B. I have no idea, though. That's crazy. It is actually splitting the lounge a wee bit as well. The barflies are not completely comfortable with this one, I think. Glen Goyne is a Southern Highland distillery, but it matures its whiskey in the warehouses that are over the Highland line in the lowlands. Oh, okay. Tullibardin is Southern Highlands. Lag is an island distillery, but on their website, because of the Highland fault line, Lag is south of that fault line, and they call on their website, they say, that is 
a lowland distillery, okay. geographically speaking. Okay. Now, I don't buy that at all. As far no. as I'm concerned, Aran is Aran, and it's an island, which yeah. is part of the Highlands region. Um, but I guess that potentially it could be argued that um, the Highland line extends and splits Aran across the middle. I don't know. But it's, I did phrase this according to their website. Okay. I'll have to look them up. Yeah, it's, it's on their website. Welsh Toro is saying great stuff, Roy. I was super interested. I wish I could remember who put it in the comment, uh, who, who drew my attention to it. But thank you for whoever did. Question eight, a whiskey book penned by Charlie McLean. One of the best V-pubs of this year. One of the ones I enjoyed most certainly anyway was hanging out with Charlie McLean earlier this year. But which uh, of these books was penned by Charlie? A, True Scottish Spirit. B, Spirit of Place. Or C, Grain of Truth. Okay, I think it's C, because I swear that you've talked about that before, but I, I don't remember. But I think C. It's a guess. Everything's a guess. <laughs> I'm really that's good. okay. I mean, that, that's the thing, Shayla, is that, you know, the, the, the quiz isn't really... There's super knowledgeable people in the, in the, in the lounge, and, and I'm trying to often cater to them a wee bit to give them questions that challenge them too. But even the ones that we have to guess at and things, if it, if it piques a little bit of curiosity or if it brings something to our attention, such as a book that I would recommend or something like that, I think that's what I have to go for. This is me kind of trying to protect myself from the abuse I sometimes get from the lounge for making the quizzes a bit tricky. But you're no. going to guess Grain of Truth. I have spoken about Grain of Truth. You're absolutely right. But Grain of Truth Woo. was a release, uh, a whiskey release, a uh, single grain from Tweeddale, Alistair Day's company, um, who owns Rassi Distillery. They, they released a single grain and called it Grain of Truth. True Scottish Spirit was completely made up. Um, and the book <laughs> is B, Spirit of Place. Okay. Another great read by Charlie. Second from last question. You started off really strong, didn't you? And then the wheels fell off a wee bit. We need to get a couple That's out of I you to get normally two out of ten. <laughs> we need to get you over the the, 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 the pass mark point. No worries. <laughs> Which established channel opens its whiskey content with the line never really been into whiskey that much? Genuinely, that's the content. The whiskey content on that channel opened with this line. Am I talking about A, Whiskey Geek, B, Whiskey Mystery, C, Whiskey Jason? Ooh, okay. Um, I, I know of one of those channels. I, I don't think they started off with that. So I'm going to guess A. Um, I don't think it's B, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's C, but I'll, I'm going to go with A. What's the channel that you know? Uh, Whiskey Mystery. That's uh, Phil and Deepa, right? They are gorgeous people. Phil and Deepa are beautiful people. We're privileged to have them in our community. Have a wee look at this, Sheila. Never really been into whiskey that much. But last year when visiting family in Scotland, we did pick up the Ardmore Legacy. It was only £25, about $40 at the local supermarket we really enjoyed drinking it. It's got a little bit of smoke in and it kind of triggered a curiosity. Is there something better than £25 Ardmore Legacy? I thought uh, a bit of YouTube research might, might help. Well, there's quite a lot of opinion on YouTube, as it turns out. Um. So there you go. Oh, dang it. Yeah. <laughs> they opened. They started their channel with never really been into whiskey that much. Fantastic. Oh, I haven't watched any of their old stuff. I've just watched like the new ones where they they do that like twelve minutes to kind of figure out a whiskey. So ah, oh, darn it. Oh well. I mean, they've taken the concept of blind tasting and really they've actually made a channel out of it. Yeah. Wonderfully compelling watching. Sometimes just seeing the two of them just enjoy whiskey and openly admit that when sometimes they're on form, they can just as easily be all over the place. Yeah. But I want to raise a wee glass and say that that video 
is two years old now that Phil and Deepa, it's quite amazing how fast time goes. Their channel has been going for two years now. Wow. They're still going very strong. And like I say, it's a privilege to have those fantastic people in our community creating content. Congratulations on two years, Phil and Deepa. Cheers. B, Whiskey Mystery. Last question. It's usually an ASAC question. I would like to know, I would like to try and remember what the question is, but I'm not very sure it's going to be as much as a surprise to me as it is to you because it's been so long since I made these questions. Um, but let's have a look to see what the scores are doing. Falsgraf is saying, I love Whiskey Mystery. Neil Cochran is on a 9 out of 10. He's doing well tonight. Hey, Daniel from is saying, I missed the ass hat question. Drew Bills is in. Cheers, brother, and thank you for you and the Scotch community. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Drew Bills is a, that's Drew from the Scotch Four Dummies. They were on a question I put out last week. You might remember I talked about, or was it on my patron only stream? It might have been on the locker on Sunday night. I talked about which channel has a four finger scoring system. And of course, it's our friends, Sean, Andrew, Mark, and Drew over at Scotch Four Dummies. Great content, been going five or six years now, maybe even seven years well. Um, great guys as well. I'm yet to meet all four of them, but I got to hang out with Drew and Mark uh, in Scotland a couple of years back and we had great fun. Drew, I'm missing you, brother. I hope you're doing very well. Cheers. Thank you for the dram. Robert Fredrickson, pass mark, seven out of nine, easy pass mark. Brian Kilko has done it as well, six out of nine. Chris Banks Wildlife, good to see you, Chris, eight out of nine. Five out of nine for Blair Stevenson already there, Don on eight, eight out of nine. Neil Cochran, as I say, nine out of nine. It's a no, it's nosebleed time. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay Holman is, is on six. Jimmy Jazz on six. Chris on seven. Gino and Neil both on six. Pretty good scoring. Graham Fraser is another nine out of nine. Wow. Yeah, I feel like this was an easier one, but I'm just not that good. <laughs> uh, no, listen, you only know if you know, Sheila. Honestly, it's that's just the way it is. Um, Let's see what question does, question 10 does for everybody. I noticed somebody else was, Kresimir is also looking for a 10 out of 10 tonight, the Sniper King. Oh, wow. Let's see what question 10 is going to do. <laughs> More or less, what has happened to malt whiskey capacity in Scotland since 2005? It's grown by 25%. It has grown by 40%. It has almost doubled. Okay, see you're such a student, aren't you? You were listening. You gave me that one. <laughs> you gave me that one. Absolutely. As we've talked about tonight, yes. Still only four out of ten, but that's okay. From about 230 uh, uh, million litres to over 400 million litres in that time. So if you've answered C as almost doubled, give yourself a point. And that should mean that we get some 10 out of 10 emojis appearing in the lounge tonight. There should be some 10 out of 10s. Got to be somebody celebrating this evening. Show me. 8 out of 10 for Chuck Malt Minion. Fantastic. Too Slow Rob gets 7. Greg's Whiskey Guide on 7 and Lindsay Holman as well. Stefan Novak got a 9 out of 10. Stefan, you just about got there. Chris on 8 out of 10. Graham Young said, grab a Glen Morris Chardonnay cask Elgin Classic and save and <laughs> send the rest to you, Roy. Graham, uh, it's nice to have you in, my friend, and thank you for the virtual dram. Uh, Dogs of No Uncles, 6 out of 10. Gino, 7. Chris Pollock, 7. Good scores. Vassal Glagola, that looks like it. Vasil Glagola, I bet you I'm butchering your name, but you had a great score tonight, my friend. It's nice to welcome you in. Precarious Dave got 7 out of 10. Daniel Vermas, Daniel Vermas got a 10 out of 10 as well. Fantastic. I'm looking, trying to catch my 10 out of 10s. Audio and Lundberg, Sid Martin, both on 9, actually 7. Sorry, Shayla. I think uh, Neil Cochran, that one. Oh my God, life is so wonderful. 10 out of 10, says Neil. <laughs> Absolutely. Local Glaswegian, great guy as well, Neil. Um, missing you as well, Neil. Um, missing the times that we can get together. It's coming, it's coming, I can feel it. Alistair Day on 7 out of 10. Peter Box uh, saying, Aquavite me. Peter, did you get 10 out of 10 tonight? And Robert is saying, I never get more than 7. Maybe I was kind tonight. Maybe it was kind. Or maybe you're just a very, very knowledgeable crowd. Can't it be a bit of both? Richard Hall on 9 out of 10. Fantastic stuff. If you got 10 out of 10 tonight, well done. Remember, if you get 10 out of 10, you're allowed 
to contribute a few quiz questions. After the popularity of Menno's quiz a couple of weeks ago, that went down very, very well. People loved it. So I've suggested that Menno can come back and maybe make it a semi-regular thing. Come on, and I can get to participate uh, as uh, in the quiz as well. What have you just poured yourself? A Glenmorangie 10? Glenmorangie 10, yep. Well, let's raise a wee glass, Shayla. Let's raise a wee glass to you and oh. say thank you so much for being brave enough to step forward and play tonight. Um, thank you for bringing content, wonderfully charming, easy, warm, friendly, accessible content, and I hope you keep bringing it. Congratulations on having an absolutely firecracker start to your YouTube career as well, and I hope you continue to enjoy it, and I hope you continue to learn and uh, be that scholar too. Shyla, it's been a pleasure to welcome you behind the bar. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And thanks for saying all those nice things that aren't true, but... <laughs> 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 well, I think they're true, and 1.7, knocking on for 1.8 thousand other subscribers also seem to think it's true as well. Oh, Sheila, thanks. thank you so much. Hang about till the end, and I'll raise a wee glass with you offline, but thank yeah. you for appearing tonight, and all the best. Cheers to you. Cheers, guys. Sanjava. Remember, Sheila's channel is Whiskey Central. It's currently located in Mexico, and she's putting out uh, great and regular content, pre-recorded and live streams as well. Wonderful stuff. Uh, I'm glad to have been able to hang out with you. I'm glad to be able to bring you a wee VPUB tonight that was just me for a wee change. I know it's difficult. I know it's me just kind of monologuing for a while. I sometimes I have points to make, sometimes not so much. Next week, I'm looking forward to doing a wee tour of Space Aid. A couple of weeks' time, I'm hoping to be able to bring you a, a thing, a collaboration talking about... Um, malt whiskey and specifically blended malts and how it can exist. I'm hoping to bring you Anthony Wills from Cohoman in December as well and also a community blind challenge that I'm going to set up myself and try and get samples out to as many people as possible so that you can interact and sip along. I'll be in touch with, uh, probably do that through Patreon of course as I'm sharing whiskey um, to work out the mechanics of that in the next few weeks. Thank you all for hanging out with me for another VPUB tonight. And I, I'm so grateful to those of you in the States who dropped in and pulled yourselves away from your Thanksgiving festivities to hang out with me for a wee bit. I actually forgot to say Happy Thanksgiving to Shayla when she came in. Hell's what is saying. Thanks for another great VPUB. Slanchy, thank you to you, Helen, as well. Thank you to everybody that's dropped in tonight. Thank you to all the fantastic barflies for your support. All your virtual drams, that means that the VPUBs will continue to be Ad free from here on in. Oh, Johan Lundberg has just bought me a dram saying, nice entertainment as always. I hope uh, it has been Johan. It's always a pleasure to have you and my friend. I'm really enjoying this nickname. I think it's a, a, a very good whiskey and a fantastic first attempt from a brand new distillery. Very encouraging. Coco's saying, the only thing I'm good at is, is talking to myself. You seem to do it expertly too, which is such, such a lovely audience. Yes, I don't talk to myself. Maybe I do. Maybe I do. Who knows? Or maybe um, my thoughts might uh, be made audible sometimes. Thomas saying, nice topic tonight. Could uh, do another whole episode on this. I know there are rabbit holes to go down. The Amber Rush doesn't just, we're not just talking about capacity. We're talking about everything in this kind of frenzy for whiskey right now. There's lots of positivity about it, honestly. It's not a negative thing to talk about. And honestly, and to summarize, if you're a drinker, you don't need to worry. We will always work together as a community, find out where the value is. And if the prices do freeze, stall, tumble a bit, whatever it is, then as a drinker, it becomes um, even more, there's even more choice available to us. So if we are genuinely enjoying just sharing whiskey and the flavor chase and the, the things that it does to bring people together and just share, then we've got nothing to worry about. Dancing Midgey, Glenn is saying thank you for another great night. Roy. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks to you. And thanks for that amazing Lagavulin Distillery oil painting. It's it's gorgeous, the one I shared at the start of the stream. Chris Polak is saying great for you, Bob. Again, thank you so much, Chris. Nice to welcome you. And Richie Z, my friend Richie, is in saying cheers, Roy. Great life. Thank you, my friend. Chris is saying good night all. I wish Thursday night was a Friday. Me too. I feel very much the same way. I have to be careful. I've only put three glasses out tonight to be... Uh, very, very careful what I was sipping because tomorrow, nine o'clock in the morning, the kids are back at school and it looks like it's me that's taking them there. A great friendly stream um, is uh, Graham Fraser is saying, uh, I just sent a wee package to you, Graham, a wee sniper coin. It's making its way on uh, over to you now. Stu Baby saying, thanks. Good session, sweet drams, barflies. Thank you, Stu. Nice to see you in. Jimmy Legg is saying, uh, Roy, always great to be here with you and all of these great people. 
I feel privileged, Jimmy. It's wonderful to hang out with you all. Molasses is in. So good to see you. I enjoyed listening while doing the cleanup after our meal. Happy Thanksgiving, Molasses. And thanks so much for dropping in uh, with us for a wee while. Actually, over in France, the same to hell with the price and the availability. All we need now is the ability to drink with others. That's what whiskey does. It attracts us in. It gets us engaged. It brings us together as people. And once we discover each other, it drops into the background. It's the wonderful thing about it. Actually, one day you and I will raise a glass together. I've been able to do that with so many of you and I look forward to the future. And I can do it with so many more of you as well. I look forward to hanging out with you again a week from tonight. And in the meantime, I'll raise this glass and say thank you very, very much to all of you. Slanchova. See you next week. Cheers. Thank mm -hmm. you.